Good morning, everybody. This is Don Miller with the, the Healthcare Authority Division of Behavioral Health and Recovery. Um, I have Darren Paskey and Paul Ferris with me. Uh, and you're in the first part of the Supported Employment, Employment Fidelity Reviewer training. Um, and so I hope you're in the right place. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Um, and please know that if you have questions as you go, you can use the chat box. We can unmute you um, if you raise your hand. There are a variety of options for being able to ask questions. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Darren if he wants to introduce himself and then Paul to, to do the presentation. Thanks, Don. Hi, my name is Darren Paskey. I'm the Supportive Employment Program Manager for Western Washington with the Healthcare Authority. And welcome everybody, because this is the first step to really broaden your horizons and learn more about the fidelity scale and by some of the attendees today um, some of you will be um, put right to work uh, later uh, this year in terms of uh, actually being on part of a review so definitely uh, take some great notes during this presentation with Paul thank you Hey, great. Thanks, Dawn. Thanks, Darren. And just by way of introduction, I wanted to make sure I introduced myself to folks. So my name is Paul Ferris. Um, yeah, so I'm here today uh, with Dawn and Darren. I'm, I'm here courtesy of Public Consulting Group, uh, which is um, an organization that has been working with Washington State Healthcare Authority to uh, kind of provide the foundation of IPS uh, supported employment services uh, as we start to ramp them up in the state of Washington. So we're a couple years into it and I've been working with Dawn and Darren for a while now. Um, and, and the reason we're all here today is because we are here to go over, it's a, it's a two day training. So day one today, we're gonna talk about the fidelity scale as Darren said, and then tomorrow we'll talk about uh, the process for fidelity reviews. So if you're here today and you're listening to me talk, you are working for an organization who has identified you as someone who could potentially become a fidelity reviewer in the state of Washington for IPS providers. So that would mean at some point, Dawn or Darren, or maybe some other folks would send you an email or call you and say, we have an organization in your area that needs to have a fidelity review, and you're the person that's gonna be on the fidelity review team. So hopefully, by the end of our two-day training, uh, I don't know if I can sit and promise you that you'll know everything there is to know about fidelity reviewing. That seems pretty ambitious, um, but you'll at least have a familiarity with what you'll be scoring and how you'll be scoring it so that uh, maybe with a little additional observation opportunities, um, you can consider yourself a fidelity reviewer for the state of Washington. Um, at least I think that's all the way it's going, and Donna Darren um, can can chime in if I'm off base there. But uh, yeah, the idea is that you're here to learn about fidelity reviewing um, as a fidelity reviewer, not as an IPS provider necessarily. Uh, and so a couple things, just format-wise today, um, this is a long haul today for a virtual training. Um, so we've got several hours here together. So I'm going to try to build in some breaks. Um, and Dawn and Darren, refresh my memory. I feel like it's been a while since we've done one of these. Um, will we be taking uh, like a brief lunch period during our training today? We will. <clears throat> we will. Okay. We will so at noon or, noon or thereabouts. Okay. And I wanted to mention enough. too, Paul, um, when we talk about fidelity review teams, in the case of what we're doing at this point in time in Washington State, if you're on a team, either Darren or myself will be the lead reviewer. So you wouldn't be doing any fidelity reviewing on your own. We're there to mentor, we're there. It's a learning collaborative process. So anybody that would end up being part of a fidelity review is gonna be part of a team and we'll work together. Um, the other thing is we're still incentivizing agencies to participate in that. And so your agency would need to have a contract um, in order for you to be uh, called upon to do a fidelity review. So just a couple of extra things. Yeah, no, that's good. Uh, that's good context. I appreciate it. That's the stuff I can't help with, Don. Thank you. Um, <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, so I will be taking breaks. We will be having a lunch. Um, and so the way I'll do that is I'll just kind of talk for a bit. Um, I'll kind of suggest a break. And if people don't want one at any point, certainly get into the chat um, uh, and let us know um, that, you know, you're not interested in taking a break and uh, just like we would if it was face to face. Right. Um, on the break, uh, that is your time. Do whatever you need to do. 
um, you know, if you want to do some more work, research into IPS, that's great. Uh, if you want to, you know, use the facilities and get yourself a little something to eat and refill your coffee or your water, um, that's all fine and dandy too. Um, and I also know that everybody's busy. Uh, so if um, with the virtual format here, if, you know, something's going on in your organization that absolutely needs your attention, um, go do that. Uh, you know, we're, we're all providers that work with people. So um, don't feel like you, you cannot, absolutely cannot leave this training. But if you do and you miss a significant chunk of it, I would encourage you to reach out to Dawn or Darren um, at a minimum to try to put back, you know, the information that you might have missed out on. Um, another thing, uh, just so everybody knows, it's worth noting here, uh, if we were face-to-face, -face, uh, we'd all be going around the room and introducing ourselves and uh, talking a little bit, getting to know each other a little bit. Uh, we'd talk about, you know, how, where's the appropriate place to park and, you know, what happens if there's a fire. But since we're all doing this virtually, we're going to skip most of that. Um, what I am going to do, though, and this will help us test either the chat or the questions box, um, I'm going to have you all just sort of chime in with your name, uh, your organization that you're representing on this call today and have you describe your first job um, and how you got it. Um, and I'll kind of start, I know I already introduced myself. So I talked about, I'm coming to you as of, uh, pub, you know, from Public Consulting Group. Um, and I do that uh, in my quote unquote spare time, whenever that is, uh, when I'm not doing that, I work at a community mental health center in Illinois, right on the border of Illinois and Iowa called Robert Young Center. And yes, it's named after Robert Young, the actor. And that's a long story I'll tell you on break maybe. Um, and so at Robert Young Center, uh, we have IPS services, as you might imagine. I've been an IPS supervisor, um, and now I'm in a, a leadership role where um, uh, IPS supervisors report to me. Uh, so that's my full-time job when I'm not doing that. Um, I work for the state of Illinois as a certified Illinois IPS fidelity reviewer. Uh, and we, um, we go around the state, just like we talked about earlier, and we review other programs that offer IPS services. Uh, and we try to kind of give them a, a feel for where they're at with regards to the fidelity scale um, with IPS. So uh, my first job, um, my first, I, I, I always give two answers here. Um, uh, Rebecca, by the way, your question, where can I find the chat box? You're, you're in it. So just keep in this area if you want to throw uh, questions or anything there. I have two kind of first jobs. The first job I really had was working for my father. He was self-employed my, my entire life. Uh, he's retired now, um, but he operated like a silkscreen apparel business. So he did t-shirts and jackets and stuff like that. And so uh, single digits, you know, six years old, five years old, I was folding shirts coming off of the dryer in our basement. Um, and if you, I always tell people, if you think your job's bad, try working for my father. <laughs> the pay wasn't great. The hours were terrible. Um, and uh, basically, I got uh, meals for working for him, which is fine, I guess, in the long run. Um, my first real job uh, outside of my own family, uh, I, I worked at the mall uh, in a store called Wilson's, uh, and I was a leather expert selling leather coats, probably overpriced leather coats, um, <laughs> to the community. Um, so that's, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Uh, Dwayne here uh, said, uh, I, let's say I-K-R-O-N, is that Icron? And my first job was washing dishes. All right, dishwashers unite, right? And I've done that. Um, Erica from Quality Behavioral Health. Um, uh, she's a certified peer counselor and an FCS provider. Great. Um, we've got Holly from Harborview Mental Health and Addictions. Uh, first job was at Safeway. Um, and it looks like she attended a hiring event. That's a really good way to get a job, actually. Um, Erica uh, says her first job was babysitting for her aunt. Uh, Bobby is work coming to us from Compassionate Addiction Treatment. Um, so welcome, Bobby. Rebecca is at Morningside. Uh, first job was a cashier at Kohl's. Uh, Brian from Kitsap Mental Health, um, first job working at a call center while also working concessions at a minor league baseball stadium during the same time. So start out with two jobs, Brian, you're an overachiever, good for you. Um, Jennifer from Goodwill Industries, uh, first job was working in the produce department at a grocery store. Uh, we've got Paul with us from Pathways in Washington. Um, and Paul says he, uh, his first job was a paper route. Uh, so single digit aged workers unite Paul, um, for sure. Um, 
We've got Lisa, uh, whose first job was picking berries. Um, Jordan from Rising Strong Catholic Charities uh, worked at a theme park. That actually sounds like a lot of fun for a first job. Yeah. Um, Danielle, uh, employment specialist, or I should say is an employment specialist at DESC. Um, Stephen from EFI, uh, first job was a lifeguard. Uh, Hallie is with us today from Compassionate Addiction Treatment. First job was working at a local community center. Uh, and we have Willis, Yvonne, and Chase from PCHS, uh, and then McDonald's, McDonald's, and Bucking Hay, respectively, were their first jobs. Uh, Rose is here from MRJ and Associates, and she says that her first job was a care provider. Um, Paul, Exceptional Foresters Incorporated, um, first job Kmart Porter. Uh, Elmo's here from MRJN. Uh, first job was cutting grass. Uh, Jacqueline's here. Um, first job was working at Rainier State School slash Western State Hospital. That sounds interesting. Um, oh, I hope I pronounced this right. Eliel um, is with us um, from Yakima Housing Authority. First job was a busser at a small restaurant, um, and then they say the first real job was working in construction as a helper at age 10. Um, and Pam is from Enric Multicare. Uh, first job was picking raspberries. Uh, Nina's here from Community Minded Enterprises. First job was working as a waitress slash dishwasher slash cook at a truck stop. So jack of all trades there, it sounds like. Um, L from MDC. Uh, first job was a custom protection officer. Uh, Patty from Village Community Services. Uh, first job was selling cedar kindling. Jason from Grant Integrated Services. First job was at Big Five Sporting Goods. And Scott from uh, Pier Kent. Um, first job was working for a neighbor's carpet cleaning business under the table. Oh, you're brave to admit it was under the table. We won't tell anybody. Um, Munzee is with us from Asian Counseling and Referral. And the first job was trimming jeans. Um, that's a new one for me. I don't think I've ever had anybody uh, that I've talked to whose first job was trimming jeans. So. Uh, <laughs> That's a first. Um, and then Rhiannon from Ease Employment, uh, first job was at a subway. So that's great. Um, thank you all for sharing. I, I'm happy to be talking with you all here. And Dawn and Darren will tell you, I am happy to kind of play things real flexible here. So if you have a question or a comment at any time, please uh, enter it into the same space you entered your first job and what organization you're, you're with. Um, I think I've tried a few different times to kind of have a, a very specific sort of time for questions. And I think we miss questions if we do that. So what I'll do, my promise to you today, is while I'm talking, I will periodically just kind of eyeball the uh, the questions box here. Um, and if Darren and Dawn, if you notice something in there that um, I haven't noticed or something, feel free to kind of jump in and uh, just put it out there that we've got a uh, we've got a question and I'll try to respond to it in a timely uh, place in, in the material today. So, uh, so what are we here Absolutely. to talk about? Oh, go ahead, Don. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, I appreciate you and Darren being my eyes. Um, there we go. Lot of things <laughs> I'm going to share my first job. Or not yeah, first, first, but one of my. I was a spray plane flagger, <laughs> which means I was at, prior to GPS, I stood there with a flag and, and uh, waved the flag until the spray plane crop duster got a bead on me. And um, then I would pace off to the next section, and every once in a while I'd feel the wings zinging above my head. And <laughs> <clears throat> obviously, it was not OSHA regulated well. <laughs> That's funny. How about you, Darren? Yeah. What was your first job? Well, I lived in Southern California, and the circus came to town. So um, I was posting circus flyers and all the local businesses. Um, where I lived down there, you know, it was great to make uh, money to go to the movies on the weekend. Sure, that's awesome. Now, did you get into the did you get into the circus for free if you do that? 
I don't remember going to the circus. I think maybe I was kind of tired of the circus <laughs> putting up flyers all day long. Only yeah, long. I bet. I bet. I could understand. A horrible sunburn after that. So. <laughs> I bet. I bet. That's awesome. Um, thank, thank you for sharing. I appreciate it. Uh, so, you know, today we're here to talk about fidelity reviewing, right? And um, so a couple things, just kind of level set some expectations. So I think most of the folks on this call should be at least an IPS provider agency. And um, ideally, you're in a position in your organization wherein you are working um, intimately with IPS services. Either you're a coworker for the IPS team or you're somebody who's actually serving on the IPS team in your agency. That would make a lot of sense to me that those would be the people who are interested in attending this uh, and the people who are interested in potentially becoming a fidelity reviewer in the future. And what's great is um, you already know more than you think you know about IPS. I just want to put that out there right now. Um, nobody knows it all, of course. I'll, I'll be the first to tell you, and I bet Dawn and Darren and I would all admit in a public forum that's being recorded, we still go to fidelity reviews and scratch our heads sometimes and have to go look at the fidelity review manual and figure out what we need to how we need to you know regard information um, so that we can score it appropriately it's just the way things are there's so many moving parts with ips um, in general and then with with an evidence-based practice like ips that has a fidelity scale it's um the manual, you know, it's like 271 pages or so for fidelity reviewing. Um, nobody, nobody remembers it all. So if you're, if you're a little sort of um, afraid of the idea or the responsibility of being a fidelity reviewer, I, I'm the first to tell you, you can do it. Um, I'm also the first to tell you, bring your fidelity review manual with you so that you can refer to it when you need to, because you can't know it all. You just can't. Um, but really, you know, again, to take a step back, the fidelity review process with IPS is relatively unique in, I would say, behavioral health care or health services in that it's um, not just an evidence-based practice, but it's an evidence-based practice with a fidelity scale that's very manualized and it's widely available for free. Uh, so if anybody, any agency ever has a question as to how well they're doing uh, with, with regards to IPS and, and maintaining fidelity, you can go out and get the fidelity review manual and you can kind of see how you're doing now it's not as good as objective folks coming in that's why we have the fidelity review process but um, it's at least a way for you to kind of know maybe how you set up a process or a procedure at your organization and so again um, if, if you get nothing else out of our time together over the next couple of days i'd like you to just kind of understand and know how important it is for you to know where these resources are, and you'll hear me say it a bunch of times, um, ipsworks.org is, is a good resource for you to have, and I'm gonna flip to it right there. I, I think, I'm gonna check my audience view. I think you can all see this. Yeah, you can. Um, so what you should be looking at is a website, and it's ipsworks.org. This is the IPS Employment Center, and, and everything you could ever wanna know about IPS is right here at your fingertips, and I don't think there's anything on this site that's um, th that costs you anything unless you go into the shop section. Um, so for example, you can read about what is IPS. You can read about the IPS Employment Center. There's an international learning community that Don Darren can tell you kind of how that relates to Washington, for example. There's training resources. And then what I always encourage people to really go look at is the ipsworks.org document library. Here you can find um, all kinds of things that will help you um, get IPS kind of started uh, in your organization. So uh, this doesn't look like the right website. Oh, it's still thinking, sorry. Um, I guess it's a little slow today. Uh, so you can see here, it's got all these different titles, things you can do. And when you click on click to view or click to download, it'll just pop right up. Um, so it has, uh, let's see here, what's a good one? a career profile form. If your organization wants to know if there's a better form for you to use for a career profile, you can just go look at this one and you can use it. There's data and record keeping for fidelity. And then I think it's on page three is really what I wanna show you all. Um, yeah, the IPS fidelity manual. This is what I've referenced a few seconds ago. 
you know, if you're going to be a fidelity reviewer, one of the things you'll need to, to grab and pull down uh, for your reference is this IPS fidelity manual. When you click to view and you open it up, what you get is this thing. And I was, uh, I've already been wrong at least once so far. Uh, I said 271 pages or 17 pages, but it's 237 pages. And what this manual is, I'll try to shrink it a little bit so you can kind of see it, um, is written by the people who created IPS. Uh, and it is exactly what it sounds like for fidelity reviews. This is the manual you would follow for doing fidelity reviews. Um, most recently updated in 2019. Um, every couple, three years, they seem to release an update, and it's it's minimally updated. Um, you know, the idea that the more you update it, the less sort of um, consistency you have, right? So it's more like tweaked. Um, over the years as opposed to, you know, wholesale changes to anything. But what's great about it, uh, if you save it to your computer um, and then check periodically for, you know, new additions, you should always have the most uprated version. But then all of these links, you click all any of these these uh, table of contents items and it'll take you right right there. So if you want to know about consensus scoring, uh, well, that one doesn't click, not click uh, a link now that I said it. But if you want to know about the staffing part of the failure, boom, it'll take you right here. Um, so it's a tremendous resource um, as we're talking. If you've already navigated there, great. If you haven't, I encourage you uh, either on break or while I'm talking to navigate to ipsworks.org, uh, go to the document library and pull up the IPS Fidelity Manual as we're going through it. You can look at the screen I'm sharing and that's fine, but um, there's nothing better than being able to kind of read, you know, read ahead a little bit if you want to and that sort of thing. So um, it's really good. It's really good information for you to have, period. Dawn said earlier, um, let's get back here. Dawn said earlier that, um, you know, you all have the ability and your organization has the ability uh, to become a, a, a fidelity reviewer on the fidelity review team. Um, and that's because at every fidelity review, there's a lead reviewer. Um, and so if, if you are on the Fidelity Review team, let's say with uh, Paul and Dawn, and Dawn is the lead reviewer, um, your responsibility as that third Fidelity Reviewer would be to do probably a lot of the same things that Dawn and I would be doing in that Fidelity Review. You'd be maybe doing some interviews, maybe doing some chart reviews, um, you know, observation of certain practices for IPS. And we're going to talk really uh, more tomorrow about the specifics of the Fidelity Review process. Um, but but really your role is, as a member of the team then is to help gather information so that information can be scored according to the fidelity scale. So um, Dawn and Darren will let you know if you're in sort of an observation only mode uh, on a review and they'll also let you know if you are in a position where you are in full on fidelity reviewer mode um, because the idea is, you know, again, you may be interviewing somebody and Dawn is interviewing someone else and Paul is off watching job development. So whatever information you gather in that interview, you're gonna have to capture in your notes so that the review team can arrive at a score for particular items. So I just want to make sure folks are kind of understanding um, maybe what the end goal is for this two-day um, time together. And I think I see that there's a, uh, a question. It says it stopped working. Um, I don't, and that's from Rose. Rose, I don't know if you mean the audio or the video or both, uh, but feel free to pop it in the chat. Um, so let's talk about the Fidelity Review, sort of the idea behind it. Um, this slide here, it says continuous quality improvement. And if you think about Fidelity Reviews and, and why we have them and what's the value in them, uh, it really does equate to continuous quality improvement. And so, you know, the way that it, it goes is a, an IPS provider, uh, let's say they didn't have any IPS services yesterday, and so today they started IPS services. Um, what they they would kind of build their team and start recruiting, uh, you know, clients into their services. And the idea is they'd use the fidelity scale to set it up the most appropriate way for them. But at some point, a fidelity review team is going to um, arrange for a fidelity review which is really just the the independent um, outside eyes coming in, seeing what you do for IPS, and then telling you how closely it aligns with the fidelity scale. It's not punitive. 
Um, it's not intended to be a gotcha. Um, it's intended to help you get better at providing IPS. Uh, so, you know, the graphic on the right side here, you know, define, measure, analyze, improve, control. This is, this is exactly what IPS fidelity reviews are all about. We're not about um, docking points because we don't like somebody's attitude or anything like that. We are all about uh, the sort of the purity of the model uh, with the idea that fidelity is fidelity. Um, I've done a lot of reviews. I think I've only been to one organization that got anywhere near perfect score. Um, they missed one point. They've been doing it a dozen years. Or so. I mean, they they were experts at it for sure. Everybody else kind of spends time in, in the fidelity range. Um, so as a provider, it's easy for me to say don't sweat fidelity. Um, but, you know, I think all we're really looking for is incremental progress when we do a fidelity review. But also there's an understanding that anything that changes might have an impact on your score. So the easiest one I can come up with is, you know, we're all healthcare providers. Turnover is something that we have to deal with every day. And if you are a provider, an IPS provider, and you're, you have two employment specialists who I don't know, let's say they get their master's degree and they move into therapy roles at an organization. That's not bad uh, for your organization, but for your IPS program, it's it's going to be a devastating thing to try to get up and over if you're still recruiting and still trying to hire a new employ employment specialist. So all of that context is worth just kind of keeping in the back of your brain as we talk through uh, some of this. And again, feel free to ask questions. You are welcome to ask questions about um, I think the way it usually goes, I should say, is people usually ask questions about the fidelity review process, but in day one in particular, I mean, we're going to talk about fidelity scale items, so it's okay to ask questions about, you know, we have we have a lot of times that people ask questions such as, uh, at my organization, we have it set up this way, how would you score it, or is it is it okay? Um, those are good, natural, curious questions. I want you to think about things both kind of from your organization's perspective, and then really you know, as a fidelity reviewer, for me, what really opened up my eyes as a fidelity reviewer is going out to these other organizations and seeing how they have rolled out the same exact evidence-based practice I have at my organization, but they've done it differently. Not better or best, and the scores are the scores, but kind of like, wow, I never even considered that that way of doing things. Um, so you'll learn a lot, too, as a fidelity reviewer, and I really encourage you to go at this with open eyes and open ears and open arms, uh, because it's... Uh, it's a really neat idea. Um, I mentioned about the IPS Works website, and they've got um, an international learning collaborative. Um, to me, one of the best things about IPS is the the idea of learning collaboration. So it's there aren't many other um, things that organizations do, uh, human services organizations do, where where there seems to be such a lack of sort of competition. Um, I've seen IPS providers in the same city. Who, who really, you know, their therapy staff and maybe their upper administration want to have a bigger market share, you know, more clients for them versus the other. But the IPS teams are are not really wired that way. They seem to be more of a, you know, I'm here for the purposes of helping people get jobs. And if that means that I need to try to link them with another organization that has some sort of unique skill or whatever, um, I'm going to do that because it'll help the client. And I, I think it's really refreshing to have that interagency collaboration um, also, a uh, hallmark of IPS is the collaboration of the IPS team within its own agency. Uh, so agencies that are doing IPS very, very well, uh, they typically have IPS teams that are really kind of integrated into the service lines of the organization. They're kind of all over the place. And you'll see as we go through the fidelity items um, that you know, organizations are kind of measured on how well they are able to integrate into the other teams, the non-employment teams, if you want to think about it that way, uh, into their own organization. Uh, and that's because IPS is most successful when it really becomes a culture of work for the folks that are served by the organization. Um, so that's very cool. And then beyond that, I think um, every state I've ever been to and ever heard of uh, has sort of a state learning collaborative. And that's why Dawn and Darren are a part of the call today. They, are, they have been instrumental in Washington in kind of assembling all of the IPS providers together and offering things like what we're doing today so that providers can learn, uh, providers can kind of grow their skill set and really reflect back on how they provide this service and, and kind of make it better for the client. Um, 
not, and again, it's not competitive. It's not about being the best in the state of Washington. I'm sure some of us are wired that way, right? Um, but, uh, you know, if we really want to do good work, then that means we really want to help people get employed. Uh, and so agencies that are very successful tend to kind of um, embrace that sort of idea of collaborative work, um, not just in their own organization, but with with all of their sort of service partners uh, locally and then statewide as well. Um, very, 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 very neat. Um, the IPS Works Learning Collaborative, it's an international, so there's, I'd have to look at the website to figure out how many countries uh, have kind of enrolled in it at this point, but I believe, and Donna, Darren, tell me if I'm wrong, but I believe Washington is a part of the uh, International Learning Collaborative as well, um, you know, which opens you up to yeah. specific training and uh, other sort of resources as well. Yep, that's absolutely the truth. Um, and I want to say there's seven countries at this point in time, maybe six, something like that. It, you know, there's new ones all the time, so I do tend to lose track, and I, I have to go check myself just to make sure I say it right. So I think I default to not saying a number. <laughs> um, but yeah, IPS is all over the world. And what's interesting is, that, you know, there's really no difference in fidelity scale for, you know, I don't know, I'll make up maybe Denmark, for example. Um, Denmark IPS providers follow essentially the same IPS fidelity scale that all of you do in Washington. The language is different, certainly. Um, but beyond that, I mean, the, the core functions of IPS are exactly the same um, across the world, uh, which, you know, rises to a level of evidence-based practice that I think very few other practices have made it to. Even something as simple as cognitive behavioral therapy, ha you know, which is an evidence-based practice, it has its limitations. And I'm not here to knock on CBT. I'm a trained counselor. I shouldn't knock on CBT, right? But nonetheless, um, it's different uh, in many, many ways. And the way people use CBT has uh, variability um, in different cultures. And so um, IPS is, um, I'm, a I'm an advocate for IPS for many, many reasons, uh, principally because whenever you meet somebody new, one of the first three questions you ask them is what do you do for a living? Uh, it's that important in our society, what you do for a living and how what work is to you and how you define yourself by work. Um, so it's it's the kind of thing that um, is is a uh, it's a major life domain uh, and it, it is a productive measure of sorts. And if we're trying to help people get better, whatever the you know primary diagnoses is for the folks that you serve, if we're trying to help people get better. Um, as as care providers, we're really we're really leaving an important thing out if we don't talk about work and help people get work right. Um, it's it's important to us all. Uh, one of the things you'll notice as we start looking through the fidelity scale uh, is that there's this sort of item here, the IPS diversity of provider type, um, and it talks about how. So I told you all I work at a mental health center. Um, if if I'm the employment specialist and I'm talking to somebody about how uh, of a job that I think they'd be really a really good candidate for, uh, if I'm telling them that in one conversation and then in a conversation, let's say with their, well, I said therapists earlier. So uh, with their therapist, if their therapist is telling them, I don't think you should, I don't think you're ready for work yet. Um, you know, that's a mixed message. It's a message that uh, you know is in direct contrast to one another. The messages are in contrast to one another, and you can see where a client might really be uh, unsure how to proceed with getting these mixed messages. So, um, with good integration, uh, we can hopefully ensure that clients receive the same message. Um, and certainly, you'll hear me talk about readiness as we spend these next couple of days together, um, and moving away from that sort of readiness idea. Um, the idea with IPS is that people are ready to work when they tell us they want to go find work. It doesn't matter if they're drinking. It doesn't matter if they're doing drugs. It doesn't matter if they're um, taking their medication or not, or if they're showing up for appointments. None of that stuff matters with regards to finding employment. Um, and it's true. Uh, it doesn't matter. The research supports it. Um, it's very definitive. Um, the note here that I want to make sure I say to folks, especially after hearing kind of the provider organizations that folks are are working with 
on this call. Um, in the fidelity scale, you'll see a lot of talk about uh, working with people with mental illnesses. Um, and that's because IPS started there. It started as an evidence-based practice for people with mental illness. Over time, and as the research has supported it, um, we have identified that IPS is very effective with many, many other populations, uh, certainly disability populations, but even populations that have nothing to do with disability. And the best example I'll give you there is the uh, federal government has several studies that show uh, how effective the IPS supported employment model can be with veterans, not veterans with a disability, but people who have served in the armed forces, period. Um, so IPS is applicable and suitable for many other populations. So if you're sitting in an organization right now that is not a mental health practitioner, mental health provider, um, whenever there's a reference in the fidelity scale to the mental health treatment team, we're just gonna change that to whatever the appropriate service team is for your population. So let's say you work at a uh, substance use disorder um, service organization. So you, you provide addiction treatment services. Um, if you're on the employment team at that organization and we see something in the scale that says mental health treatment team, the, the Dawns, the Darrens, the Pauls, the, the future yous on this call, we're not going to go look for a mental health team at that organization. We're actually going to look for you to integrate with and connect with the appropriate substance use clinical team, whatever whatever they call it at that agency. Um, some people call it a treatment team. Some people call it, you know, whatever team. Um, but that's really what we'd, we'd be looking at as it's relevant to, to that organization. So we're just going to sub out um, mental health when relevant and appropriate uh, to whatever the team is for that particular population. Another example I'll give you, um, I did a fidelity review uh, for a team in Chicago and, and uh, while it's a mental health center that kind of has, has, that employs this team, the team provides services to individuals if they are deaf or hard of hearing, period. They don't have to have a mental health diagnosis. They don't have to have any disability or any, you know, they don't have to have anything sort of uh, that qualifies them for mental health center services. All somebody would really need to do is just kind of identify that they have some sort of hearing deficit um, and this team will help them find employment. So when we reviewed that team, we looked for the relevant sort of quote unquote treatment team for them. And so there was some, um, you know, uh, specific um, sort of hearing treatment professionals at the table uh, for their, they called it a clinical team meeting. Um, there was also um, a member from, uh, in Illinois, it's called the Department of Vocational Rehabilitation. Um, so, you know, you, you kind of interpret some of these terms for each agency, if that makes any sense to you. Um, and so I just want to take a minute here and just kind of let that um, let that kind of bounce for you. Um, and then Dawn and Darren, certainly if you have anything Washington specific or otherwise that you wanted to chime in on in this particular, I mean, you know the providers way better than I do, of course, in Washington. So I'm, I'm happy to have you chime in here. Sure. Well, and I, one thing I just wanted to talk about when you're mentioning treatment teams and, and the fact that IPS was originally written for working with people with mental illness, um, when we're looking at those those treatment teams and in, in other agencies um, or support teams or service teams or whatever we might end up calling them, um, what we encourage agencies to do is to consider who sends you your referrals. Mm -hmm. Who Do you have a couple of teams that send you the most referrals. Maybe it's your housing team. Maybe it's uh, maybe maybe it is DVR. Maybe it's it's whomever. And so we kind of put it in context uh, by encouraging agencies to consider who sends them their referrals. Um, and then that's who you better be collaborating with. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's kind of the bottom line. <laughs> For sure, that's a good point, Dawn. And you know, one of the first things I do in an organization in, in the kind of day one in the morning is I really try to spend time um, help, having an organization kind of walk me through how they define some of these things. Um, and it, it can be really helpful. And you know, another part of the fidelity scale where I have people try to interpret it for me is you'll see that we will score um, executive team support for IPS and every agency is set up differently first. Um, and second of all, you know, the titles are really 
I don't want to say they're cheap or whatever, but you know, some organizations have a CEO, some have a president, some have an executive director, some have a clinical director and a support director. You know, so you really need to spend time understanding from the team and the organization on that day one, you know, who do they consider their executive team? Is it, you know, the chief financial officer or is there sort of like a, I mean, I've been to an organization where there's a, the QA director is the person who is on all of the legal documentation for the organization, but they don't call them president or CEO or any of that stuff. They, they're the QA director. Um, and so it's not for me to judge whether I like it or don't like it. It doesn't matter what Paul thinks. What matters is, you know, what matters in that particular example is, so if your QA director is your president, essentially, are they involved in IPS in any meaningful way or are they completely separate from it? So, so the first thing I think that is worth doing at an organization is just understanding uh, how they interpret some of the key terms of the fidelity scale. Um, if it, you know, so you know as a reviewer how to more appropriately, more fairly um, provide a score to them upon your exit of from the fidelity review. So um, let me stop right here for a second and see if there's questions. Um, we've been going about a little over 40 minutes, so I just I know it's been a little light duty, but I just want to make sure if people have questions right out of the gates that we take a minute to answer them. And Donna Darren is what well, you you're both always welcome to chime in at any of these points too. And I I, uh, I was just going to kind of chime in with a, a public service announcement, if you will, while folks are thinking about their questions. Um, we are still looking for uh, agencies that want to be part of a, of a fidelity review team on the supportive housing side. And I know that there's a lot of agencies that do both supported employment and supportive housing. So supported employment, we've been, Darren and I have been incredibly fortunate in that we've had a lot of agencies be interested in either hosting a review, being on a review team, something like that. Um, fewer on the supportive housing side. So if your agency also does supportive housing, um, you know, that may be something, if you're not going to do supported employment, consider whether you might do supportive housing in relationship to a fidelity review. So, and I'm assuming that, in fact, I know a lot of the folks that are on the call are because they've got a review upcoming um, or we're going to be a reviewer upcoming. And so that's the reason why they're here. Sure, um, sure. And we want to set them up with all the info they need, they feel like they need, too. I'm going to just add to that public service announcement, Dawn, because um, there's a great training coming up for the Golden Thread series, which is going to focus on um, medical necessity and uh, documentation. It's a six-part series. I think that comes up in the next month. Um, and if people are interested in it, um, you can put your email in your chat box so we can make sure you're on our Gov delivery system to get that information and a wealth of other trainings that come out um, monthly uh, from the HCA. Um, and the last piece I'm gonna um, talk about is um, the HCA is incentivizing some new contracts. Um, currently, uh, we're looking for providers who are interested in implementing um, supportive housing, supportive employment, and a substance use um, disorder SUD uh, facility. So if your agency is currently performing those functions and interested, please reach out to Don or myself so we can talk to you more um, about those incentive dollars. Thanks. All right, those are good PSAs. I feel like I should have one. I don't know. Get your vaccine and stay safe. That's a good PSA, right? I don't know. Oh, you have good so advice. much good information that you don't have to have any PSAs. How about that? Oh, you're, you're too kind. You're too kind. <laughs> um, so uh, I, I think we might have a question. I just saw the little uh, thing pop up. Um, okay, Looks like so we're to put in her, right, her email address to be put on the distribution list. So we'll make yep, sure that perfect. happens. Yep. Um, and anyone else too, if you want to get put on a distribution list, by all means, please share your email address so we can get get stuff to you. Um, what I pulled up, I figure what we'll do here, since we're kind of coming up on the hour, is I'll just kind of walk through a little bit of this fidelity, with, uh, orient you to the fidelity items, and then uh, leave you with a question. We'll break for about five to ten minutes, and then when we come back, we'll just kind of start getting some of the answers to the question, um, and we'll start chugging through these fidelity items. Um, I'm trying to figure out the best way to uh, break all of this up in a way that kind of 
uh, works for everybody and sometimes it's difficult. So, so this is the Fidelity sort of scoring sheet. Um, and it's a really nice way to look at all of the items that you will score an organization on as a Fidelity reviewer. And the first thing I always like to point out is, just keep in mind, it's broken up into three sort of pieces of Fidelity. The first is staffing, which is comprised of caseload size, and that is um, the average, we'll talk about it, but it's the average caseload size between all of the employment specialists. So, you know, if you go in and you talk, you're doing an interview with an employment specialist uh, and they tell you that they have 35 people on their caseload, you may think like, oh gosh, the fidelity scale says a maximum of 20, but it's an average of all the employment specialists. So um, if another employment specialist has only six on their caseload, you average six and 35, you know, um, you may be closer to 20 than you originally thought in that one interview. So again, that's all the more reason for Dawn and Darren and I to make sure we take good notes in interviews, because when I come back to the table, if the only thing I have to say is, well, I didn't get the number from them or the caseload size, and Darren and Dawn are gonna have a hard time scoring this item you know, because I don't have the notes. So um, you'll hear me say that over the next couple of days, um, you know, about how important it is to kind of keep good notes and, and they have to make sense to you. Uh, that's the important thing with Fidelity Review Notes. Um, I don't think I've ever been on an interview where, you know, like Dawn says, Paul, give me your notes and I'll do the scoring. Because uh, you'll hear we have a thing called consensus scoring where we all go through the scores together. And according to my notes, I share what I think I can most reliably score an item so again, the notes really just have to make sense to me because Dawn's not gonna need to read them. And she, if you, any of you saw my handwriting, you'd know that Dawn couldn't read my handwriting anyway. So, because um, it's, it's terrible. Um, <laughs> the second item of staffing is employment services staff. The third item is vocational generalists. And we'll go into a more thorough review of these in a few minutes here after the break. But in the organization section, you're really looking at how the employment services are integrated in the organization, um, how they've kind of made space in IPS, or a space in the organization for IPS. And you can see here right out of the gates, the first two items are measuring the integration of um, the IPS team into the teams of the agency. And so here's an example of that sort of caveat I talked to you about on the last slide. It says mental health uh, team, um, but if, if you don't work in a mental health organization or you're at an organization that doesn't have a mental health treatment team, this is where we would just kind of want to tweak the language when we're looking at these scores for the most appropriate clinical team. And Dawn's right. She, um, that's a great question to kind of ask the agency, where do your referrals come from? Um, because that's really who, that's the team they support, if you want to think about it that way. Um, we also look at the collaboration between employment specialists and the voc rehab counselors, how they've constructed the vocational unit, how the employment supervisor um, kind of provides the most appropriate supervision for the team. And you'll, when you cruise around IPS Works website, one of the things you'll see um, in a couple of different documents is that IPS is only as good as its supervision. Uh, and that is true. Um, so you'll really want to understand from the IPS supervisor how they execute their role so that you can score this item. Uh, there's some real specific elements of this item that are worth uh, just making note of. Zero exclusion criteria, uh, the agency focus on competitive employment, and the executive team support for supported employment going to organization. Uh, and then services. This is really sort of the what they do part of IPS. Um, and it looks at all of these things listed here. I won't read all of them to you just for, for the sake of time and because we're going to go through them. But one of the things I'll tell you all is um, on almost every Fidelity review that I've been on, the staffing portion and the services portion, the IPS team seems to have that down. They know it pretty well. They do a pretty good job at it. It's the organization part that really starts to get difficult for them because it requires another entity. Almost every one of those items requires another entity for them to score very well on this, those items. So, you know, they need executive support in order to integrate fully with the other teams in the organization. They need good supervision in order to, you know, have zero exclusion. So those interplay between items are really important for you to flag as you're kind of going through a fidelity review. And you'll learn, um, just like I did, and just like Dawn did, and just like, you'll learn sort of what to listen for. Um, and then again, when you don't know, that's okay, because we've got the fidelity review manual. And if the fidelity review manual doesn't answer the question or concern you have as a review team directly, you've also got 
consensus scoring to kind of lean back on or fall back on where if Dawn and Darren and I don't have you know, the automatic knowledge of what, how to regard something in terms of scoring, the first thing the three of us are going to do is consult the manual. And if the manual doesn't overtly say, score it this way, Dawn and Darren and I are going to have some discussions. We may ask the IPS team to provide us with more information. We may, I always call it phoning a friend. So you'll develop fidelity review sort of colleagues. You may shoot them an email or give them a call and say, hey, I'm at this organization. And They've got this, that, and the other, um, and I'm thinking it's a three, um, but I'm just, I don't know, I'm really not sure. Um, and you just kind of get a little external feedback from it, uh, from somebody, from a colleague, just to kind of, if nothing else, kind of validate what the team's thinking. <clears throat> um, and, and it ends up working out. And if you score it one way, let's say you score a four, and the team says, um, yeah, but there's all these other things that we didn't show you that would impact the score as a fidelity reviewer. The easy answer is, well, I was there for two days. Like, why didn't you show it to me? <laughs> you know, um, and it doesn't have to be contentious or anything like that. Um, and I know there's some ability Dawn has mentioned, you know, after the fact for an organization to kind of provide supplemental information. So there's even sort of a fail safe there, all of which I say to really just kind of underscore, we're not there to do gotchas. We're not there to catch anybody doing something. We don't expect perfection. Um, we're there as fidelity reviewers to give them the most accurate score, period. Um, it doesn't matter to me as a reviewer if they're at 125 on the scale or if they're at 80 on the scale. I want to have them scored what is most appropriate and accurate for the services they provide. Uh, and then I want to be able to provide recommendations or feedback to them on what they do really, really well, because every organization does things really, really well. And I also want to provide feedback to them on the things that they could use some work on, um, not necessarily how they could make the score better um, or the right path to that. But, you know, here's what the fidelity manual says would be a five. And right now you're scoring a three. So here are some things to consider. Um, so, again, this is very collaborative, um, two way communication um, approach to getting the most accurate score. And beyond that, it, the, again, there's no editorializing or anything like that. Organizations are provided with a full report that describes the fidelity review activities. Um, at, you know, So we're all very transparent with this. We're not trying to pull any punches. Um, so it's about uh, seven minutes till. So what I was thinking is uh, around five till we could break and then kind of come back five after the hour. Um, so the question I was going to leave everybody with is um, either as a provider agency or as a potential fidelity reviewer, what are the things about fidelity reviewing that either you're most afraid of or um, worry you or the things that you feel like, gosh, I don't know if I could, I don't know if I'll be able to get that in order to be an effective fidelity reviewer. So really just kind of wondering what are those things out there that spook you about the fidelity review process, either as a provider or as a potential fidelity reviewer, because I think there's probably some similarities between the two. Um, and if that makes sense, then what I'll do is I'm just going to kind of mute my mic and I'm going to take a little break and then I will see you all a little, right around five after the hour. Um, and you're welcome to type answers to that question into the question uh, chat. Um, but I'll also um, ask it again when we come back from break. So I will see you in a few minutes here.
how's everybody doing today? Hopefully having a good day. I am actually uh, in my my home office in Moses Lake, which is where I'm coming from, and it's sunny and supposed to go up to 58 degrees today. So I feel pretty fortunate. I'm seeing some good responses in the chat box from Paul's question. So do by all means continue with that as well. And I'm back, Dawn. I'm looking at some of these. These are some great questions folks have. Yeah, absolutely. I'll just wait for a couple more minutes um, just to wait for a few more to come in, but it's be good to start with. And I, I can't stress enough, don't, no one feel like you're alone when you're doing fidelity review because you'll be on a review team. And one of the things that I think both Darren and I do is we spend time with the review team members prior to the review, doing a little more coaching about here's what to expect and you know, kind of here's what you're going to do. And then during the review, you know, we kind of guide, uh, you know, we're all going to be in this particular interview and listening to the unit meeting as an example or whatever, and kind of let folks know what's going to happen in each particular circumstance. So uh, nobody's turned loose. <laughs> Everybody's part of a team and we all collaborate and talk. And, um, you know, I'll mention it. You had already mentioned, Paul, but I'll mention the notes again. Um, I cannot stress how important it is to take good notes during the review because uh, maybe not in every consensus scoring meeting that we do, but pretty often somebody will hear something that I didn't or one of the other team members didn't that, it, that changes the score one way or the other. So, um, and I will promise that you cannot remember everything that, that people have said, so you've got to take good notes. I just, I can't stress that strongly enough. Agreed. Um, and a lot of it, too, uh, I'll just kind of add to that, Dawn, is um, uh, so the way we do things in Illinois is not the same way that every state does things. So in Illinois, we do a fidelity review. It's a two-day review. By the end of that, we have given the organization sort of a, a tentative score based on what we saw. And then we, one of the, usually the lead reviewer, will create the fidelity report, send it out to the other two fidelity reviewers, for their observations um, and, mm -hmm. and so here's the thing even if even if I get that report two weeks after the fidelity review without my notes it would be probably impossible for me to recall with any specificity why I scored something a four or or what the recommendation was is, is probably more important what the recommendation is for the organization because at the end of the day we want all this to be valuable information that we provide to the organization that helps them get better and it's actionable data so if you're if your notes or you don't take notes or if your notes aren't very um, they aren't they aren't a good enough quality you're gonna have a really difficult time as a reviewer providing feedback to the organization mm -hmm. absolutely and I, I know we talk about score and the score is certainly important it, it places you you know, whether you're not supported employment or fair fidelity or good or exemplary or whatever. But truth be told, my personal opinion, the recommendations are more important than anything. That and the kudos that we give agencies, that, that narrative that explains why they got the score um, is so much more important than the, the, the score in my mind. And I think back to being a kid and getting a report card, if you will, the A's or B's or whatever were, you know, great. But when I got a comment from the teacher, um, or, you know, for that matter, my, my own personal evaluations when I've been working, you know, whatever the score is, the score is. But when I got a comment, that's when it became clearer in my, my head and more meaningful to me as far as what they were talking about. And it's the same thing with the Fidelity Report. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. It, it is a, I always like to imagine that the fidelity review process really just holds a mirror up for the organization so they can kind of see with outside eyes how they are performing uh, beyond mm -hmm. that beyond that there's really like i said earlier there's no editorializing or anything like that so so really my job as a reviewer is not to to my job is to follow the process that's been laid out by ipsworks.org and the ips employment center um, so that that mirror is, you know, not a funhouse mirror, but a very accurate mirror for them. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, that's the best thing we can do. 
Um, so it's uh, 12, uh, 10 08, probably your time. Um, I'm just going to start going through some of these um, confessions from folks here. Uh, so the first one is I'm new in this all. I'm a little nervous, but so excited to do this because I will also be learning so much and I think it will add so much to our program. So not only am I reviewing, but also learning and pick it, picking up new skills. Absolutely. Um, Bobby wrote that in. And I'll tell you, Bobby, again, as a provider, I think your um, <clears throat> your program will by default get better because of your work as a fidelity reviewer like you understand things sort of from a different perspective so um that's a good comment and i i totally agree with it um alana says being new to the field and the process um i think following a sheet like the one presented will definitely help jog questions if left to ask questions on my own i feel i would forget key points after attending these several times, I am feeling more confident in my ability to ask the right questions. That's great. Um, and I'll put another plug in for the Fidelity Review Manual um, that has got sample questions on it. And there's no shame in uh, following those sample questions in an interview, especially if you're in your first interview kind of solo. Um, I did that uh, when I was a brand new Fidelity Reviewer. Um, I kind of had a crisis where I felt like I, I didn't know anything that I thought I knew well, you know, about one minute before I was supposed to go interview somebody. Uh, and I just got out the Fidelity Review Manual and started asking the questions. Um, and, you know, you know more than you give yourself credit for, is what I'd tell you. Um, so, yeah, you're you're going to be in good hands um, with with uh, Dawn and, and Darren, that's for sure. Hey, Paul, I just want to jump in because I just completed a review last week, and I already went back to the manual to check it in. So part of my <clears throat> tools that I share with everybody is the Fidelity Scale in the Manual. And I don't want people to expect that they have to go through those multiple pages um, to really, um, you know, absorb as much as you can before the review. It's good to kind of learn where some of the information is at, because as a group, when we look at things, we'll be going through some of that together. But it's good to be familiar, but I don't want people to think that they have to like study the manual uh, before uh, we actually do the review process. And I've been doing this a year now, and I still go back and review to look at some of the information in the different sections to get clarification. It's about clarity and learning together. Yep, absolutely. And I'm the same way. I, I have mine. Mine's a beat up old version. Um, and it's I've got, you know, notes scrawled in the margins and post-it notes and, um, you know, whatever it, you can do to have your manual make sense to you. Um, and you'll see as we start going through some of these items today, um, there are some items that, you know, they make perfect sense, but there's one sentence in the manual that says, oh, yeah, but when you see this, only score a four. And, and those are the really the things you want to know. If you have to remember one thing about a particular item you're scoring, you want to remember, um, or or at least have something to jog your memory um, in the manual that says, yeah, but don't forget about this particular scenario. Um, and so, yeah, uh, it's good, good point for sure. Well, and I'm going to say that I expect everybody to uh, actually uh, memorize the manual. <laughs> Kidding. Kidding. <laughs> I was going to say, Dawn, we lost the connection with you all of a sudden, it seems like. Uh, <laughs> everybody yeah. simultaneously no, kicked you off the call. That's my expectation. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, that would be that would be quite a feat for sure. I don't think I know anybody that memorized it. The only person, to be honest, I know it was a, a joke, but I there is a guy in Illinois who helped write the manual that I've worked with, and his ability to recall portions of the manual without it in front of him uh, i mean it's absolutely spectacular to be a part of uh but beyond the guy that helped write it i've never known anybody that didn't have a copy with them or at least available to them you know they have a laptop or something and have it and pull it up online so um yeah there's certainly mm -hmm. no pressure for memorization um at all <laughs> we have enough I, for, I, i'm sorry i couldn't resist <laughs> no i don't blame you that was a good one <laughs> Uh, um, so Gene writes in here regarding the two job development role plays, how valid is it when we do not meet real employers in the community? So uh, I'm not sure if this is related to a comment that was happening on break or if this is about job development shadowing. Um, this, so, is, this is in relationship to what we've done differently doing virtual fidelity reviews. Oh, sure. Um, I, have to, I have to say it's not sanctioned by the Westat folks. It was the, mm -hmm. you know, as we were trying to figure out what we were doing early on, this is what we came up with. Um, it's, it's, um, we make very clear that this is not the ideal. Mm -hmm. That because we're doing things virtually, we wanted to continue to give agents feedback. 
Um, and this this was early on when we were hearing from the West App folks, don't do anything, let's just wait and see. Well, COVID's going on for an awfully long time. And we wanted to continue to get that incentive money out to agencies, knowing that with COVID and that, the way they had to change their, their business practices, um, you know, that some agencies were just failing financially altogether. So a part of this is based on us wanting to make sure to have that financial incentive available. And so when we did the, the came up with the job development role plays, we did so as the only way we could think of in order to, to actually come up with some kind of meaningful feedback related to that. What sure. I will say is it's in the long run better than I thought it would, still not as good as going out to observe job developers going out in the community. So that's yeah. kind of my response to that. Yep, I agree with everything you said, Dawn. And you know, I guess what I'd say too is, I mean, with uh, role plays, you're at least getting you're at least able to score something that you observed without role plays, you know, you wouldn't be able to score those items. So I think it's better. And like you said, is it perfect? Probably not. But you know, the other side of it too, just kind of related to this comment is part of the fidelity re review process is we go in and we tell agencies, bring us 10 charts to review. And I, it always amazes me that, you know, you'll review a chart and it doesn't have something in it you're looking for when we've asked the organizations to kind of pick their own charts. So, you know, I, I, I guess my counter question could be how how valid is it for us to ask agencies to do their own chart pulling in a fidelity review, you know, whereas maybe yeah. with a, go ahead. No, I was just, yeah, no, I agree with you. I'm sorry. It was just a spontaneous, yep. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, so, you know, I think a lot of this, just to kind of sum up this particular question, a lot of the fidelity review process is good faith exchange of information. And I know that at probably eight or nine out of 10 agencies, they look through the charts before the fidelity review and they probably pick the best ones they can find. And and that's fine. Uh, you know, I'd rather see the, the work that's reflective of how great they can do um, rather than a chart that's, you know, a mind feel. I don't want to give them a score based on, you know, the outlier, I want to give them a score based on what's really happening in their charts. So in the same way, I mean, you kind of get, it's not perfect, but you get a good idea through a role play, you know, where people need help. And, and I'll tell you too, even with real employers in the community, I mean, again, employment specialists, <laughs> they don't pick employers in the community that they're, they have terrible relationships with, you know, they, they pick, uh, we always, I would love to have, um, somebody they've got a longstanding relationship with and they've got somebody placed or recently placed at an employer. I'd love to have somebody who's like had an applicant and you know, they're kind of in that stage. And I'd love to see job development where they kind of do a cold call and you know, they see a now hiring sign or whatever and go talk to a hiring manager for the first time. The reality is time doesn't always allow for those three events to occur. Um, and so often what I'm left with as a fidelity reviewer is I watch somebody do job development with an employer that they obviously have a tremendous relationship with. And so mm -hmm. that's all I can score. And at some point, you know, again, if you go back to, we're not there to do gotchas and, you know, we're not, um, we're not doing a, a, you know, any sort of audit or anything like that. I mean, I, I'm happy with the agency telling me we do great work. Look, see, we do great work. Um, and I'll say, yeah, it looks like you guys do great work. Um, I don't have a problem with that at all um, because they do. Mm -hmm. I just watched it. You know, I watched it happen. Um, so one of the things in general that I like about uh, the IPS sort of process with all of this is you'll see, um, basically you try to give them the score that's the highest full score that is met. So it, rather than flagging them on, you know, the one error you find, a lot of what we're gonna score is percentages, which, um, you know, really mitigates the whole sort of one-off problem uh, you know, that, that agencies may have. So we're going to give them credit when we can, and we're going to, um, we're, we're going to try to give them, uh, a score that's as fair as possible. So, um, a good question. Very good question. Uh, the next one is, um, a fear that I'm not able to get enough information through telecommunication. And I think what man means here is, um, like through the virtual format. Uh, and, and, you know, I think that's something we're all sort of struggling with, like Dawn mentioned, um, you know, it's really, it's not ideal. I mean, it's just not, none of it's ideal. Th this training, uh, spoiler alert, this two day training where I'm talking to you over a webinar and I can't see your reactions on your faces and you, 
can't see me and et cetera, et cetera. Um, it, this is not ideal. <laughs> the last 12 months have kind of been not ideal. So we're just trying to put it together. <laughs> uh, that's a rational fear um, that we're not able to get enough information. But remember, as a reviewer, um, by default, when you feel like you don't have enough information to score an item, I want you all to remember, ask for more information, period. Just, just say to the organization, do you have other information we could use to score on such and such, whatever the item is? Um, they'll bring it to you. And if they don't have it, they'll tell you, I don't have it. And, and then you can only score what you saw. Um, so uh, it's not a perfect science. You know, we're not doing organic chemistry here. This is people business. And so that it's going to have inherent flaws. Um, but it is, of all the sort of practices that your average health services agency does, this one is the most manualized and sort of um, standardized work with regards to review that I have I have found. Um, I, I mean, how, what better as a fidelity reviewer could you have in your arsenal than a full fidelity manual that's based on research that tells you exactly how to score all the information you receive and then at least two other fidelity reviewers that when you don't know what to do, you could kind of bounce an idea off of them with regards to scoring and the three of you come up with a consensus score. Um, I mean, there's a, a big safety net um, as a fidelity reviewer. So, um, and again, you know, if you get it wrong and it's a three and the agency says, yeah, but you know, we think it's a five and here's why, maybe they didn't show that information to you and you just say, okay, well now that we know that, <laughs> it's different, right? Um, so be flexible, be open-minded, nothing set in stone. Uh, Darren says, my biggest fear is finding out that I have been doing something wrong all this time. I think probably all Fidelity reviewers uh, worry about that. But again, if you stick to the knitting of the Fidelity Review Manual, um, you know, you, you should be, you should not have, you, this should just be a fear. It shouldn't be something that realizes itself. Um, at the end of the day, if the organizations don't give you the information, all of the information they have available to them, that really ends up being on them, not on you. Um, and, and you kind of got to leave it there, um, unfortunately. You know, Paul? Um, from the point. Oh, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say that's a really good point because um, we're all trying to get as much information and find out what the agency is really doing well. And that can really affect us as a team if we're not able to get all the information. And one thing um, that we try to do is have a debrief uh, appointment for the review team at the end of the day so we can collectively ask more questions uh, from the agency we're viewing to see if we missed something or an opportunity to collect some more information to kind of answer some of those questions as they come up during the review because questions will come up um, it's yep. a virtual process things can get a little wonky uh, we all need you know a little extra bandwidth of patience and plus doing things virtually it, it's a little bit more exhausting I think than doing <clears> face to face yeah, and yeah, you know, that's a good point. Go ahead, Dawn, because I, I got I have something I'll add to after you guys both kind of get your points in. Oh, I was just gonna say to Darren, if you're kind of referring to the fact that um, you find out that you're doing something wrong within your own agency based on the fact you're a fidelity reviewer, it's a learning collaborative. That's that's part of what it's about, is to be able to certainly review the agency that, that's being reviewed, but also to take back with you lessons learned about things that you might use to improve your own. Uh, services. So um, it's not so much the the doing something wrong, it's the how can we do better, that continuous yep. quality improvement. Sure. Agreed. That, that was that. Was yep. And I, uh, I think I forgot the point I was going to add in there, to be honest with you. <laughs> um, I'm sorry. But, no, that's okay. That's okay. It must not have been too important. That's what I always say. Um, it, uh, you did, I, I can almost guarantee all of you as a fidelity reviewer, you will learn things on a fidelity review that you can take back to your organization and implement to make it better, to improve your scores. I, I almost guarantee it. Um, somebody's going to be using some slick document that you never thought of and you're going to use it and everything's going to solve some big problem for your team. Um, it's really cool and it is collaborative in that way, like Dawn said. Um, <clears throat> the next one here says to deliver a good report and giving feedback. Um, you know, this is a good statement, Nina. Um, you've got a team. It's not all on you. Though, so that's the first thing I'd say. Um, and this is kind of related to the next comment too. Paul says, for my first review, fear of the unknown, questioning my own performance, am I doing well? What do I need to improve? Being vulnerable. Um, remember, it's not all on you. You know, you got a team. Uh, so you've got a fidelity review team. So, you know, 
you don't have to be perfect. You just got to be human uh, and, you know, learn, sure, learn. And, and I don't think, um, and Dawn and Darren, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think the plan is to take you from this this webinar and throw you right into a fidelity review as a reviewer. I think there's additional observation opportunities um, for folks because at some level too, we want to make sure that the next reviewer, um, you know, has some capacity to to provide the feedback we need them to provide. So, um, you know, there's a again, there's a safety net. Um, you've got all kinds of resources at your disposal, and it's not at all like the spotlight's on you. Here's your, you know, it's not, you don't have to tap dance in the spotlight for the other reviewers. Um, so we're there to right. do it together. So, uh, and, and I always tell new reviewers too, I, whether it's, you know, on a break or, you know, hallway conversation or something, I always encourage them, hey, if there's a spot in the Fidelity review that you feel like you haven't seen enough to score accurately, let me know and we'll do it together. So if there's somebody mm -hmm. who, you know, I've never interviewed a group of clients before, um, fine like let's do that together then we won't make you go solo on it uh, or i've never done a chart review before you know just raise your hand and say that and the review team will kind of accommodate that so that you are comfortable and nobody wants anyone else to be uncomfortable throughout all of this yeah and i will say that that um one of the things that that happens partially because i'm a chatty kathy and partially because i take my lead reviewer responsibility or role very responsibility very seriously is that usually if um, I have a, when I have a team of reviewers, I may start out with the introduction. Um, I may ask the first few questions and then say, team, what questions do you have? Um, if somebody doesn't feel comfortable asking a question, I don't ever push them into doing it. When they are comfortable, then they can ask questions. And typically they end up being from that list, at least to start out with. Yeah. Um, there are folks in this training that are gonna go on a review in the not too distant future once again, with us as, as leads and, and kind of guiding things and sharing and mentoring. So my, my responsibility as a reviewer is to review the agency, but it's also to provide mentoring to the reviewer team so that they learn more about Fidelity as well. When we do our chart reviews, um, what we do is a, a Zoom meeting and we have all of us in the same spot. We have the agency show us or tell us where to find things in the chart and then they leave. And the review team members are still there and we talk with each other. Have you found this? Where did you find this? What did it look like? Does this qualify to address this? Does this? So we actually have that conversation during the period of time that we're doing the chart reviews um, together. And by the end of the first one, I think, you know, first chart review that you do, and usually folks either do two or three of them, depending upon the size of the team. Um, by the end of the first one, then they have a, a little more comfort level, a little more idea of where things are uh, to be found. But I volunteer at any given time if somebody needs help with writing the report, if somebody needs help with doing a chart review, if somebody needs help with whatever, that's part of what I'm there for. Yep. And so, yeah. Dawn, in Washington, do you, uh, does the lead reviewer kind of take the responsibility of putting the final report together? Yeah, we synthesize oh. the pieces of that everybody sent in. Um, you know, in some cases, clean them up a little bit if they've missed the intent. Uh, and then we send the draft back out for the review team to take a look at because once again, that's a learning experience. Gee, this is what I wrote. This is how it got, you know, tweaked. So I, I see what the difference is kind of a thing. Um, sure. And then also. Dawn, are you still there? Well, I'm, I'm not sure where Don went, but definitely, you know, we look at all the information um, that people provide during the report development okay. and it's a very shared collaborative yeah. process. Very much so. Yeah. And and really, I mean, I think I think I can speak for probably all lead reviewers across probably across the world at this point. I mean, the last thing we want to do to another fidelity reviewer is put them in a spot where they feel unprepared, um, you know, to to get to to deliver sort of the score. So um, mm -hmm. the team is collaborative as well as the process. So um so yeah uh we we'll make sure that everybody feels comfortable um doing what they're doing that that is that is a for sure um another comment sort of on the same theme is uh, i'm worried that i will not know what i'm looking for i'll know more after this training of course but i guess being efficient is my worry um so again sort of along the same lines there from nina um 
And then Harrison says, as a provider for services and being new to the program, so I'm just worried that I may not always be doing everything right or leading people to the right place. Slowly learning and getting things down, but just that overall anxiety of doing the job right and making sure I'm actually helping my clients. Always nerve wracking to make sure that I'm doing my best and lining up with fidelity. Also with employer contacts, it feels I'm not doing my best with COVID and play. Um, I think we all kind of feel that way, first of all, Harrison. Um, and, and then somebody else chimed in, Christy chimed in. Uh, that's my fear too. I've uh, been doing this so long. What if I've been doing it wrong all along? So the counselor in me and uh, Paul would say to you all, you know, this is great. All of this anxiety that you're all kind of ventilating with us here, that this is great because um, to me, anxiety shows that you care about something and you want it to go well. Uh, so um, th that's uh, all coming from the right place. And so now I'm totally convinced that nobody's going to have fundamental problems with the fidelity review process uh, because if if you care this much to kind of bare your soul to us with regards to IPS in the questions uh, box um, I, I know you'll have your fidelity review with you and you'll be ready uh, for the fidelity review and when something pops up that's outside of your comfort zone I know that you will raise your hand and you'll say to Darren or you'll say to Dawn or you'll say to Paul um, I've not seen that yet or I've only seen that happen once um, could, can we do that together uh, and then we'll we'll figure it out so um, these are great comments we haven't really asked these in previous trainings and I'm glad I did um, I like a yeah, lot. they're hard, to, I think it's they're hard to kind of stumble into an answer to some of these things, right? Um, so if mm -hmm. I'm giving mm -hmm. any of you the impression that I know everything about IPS and every time I do a fidelity review, it's absolutely perfect. Let me just um, tell you secretly that I've made a bunch of mistakes and I'll probably make a bunch more. Um, and I'm not looking for me or any of you to be perfect. Um, I'm looking for you to kind of be prepared and know a basic level of what we're trying to do and then um, collaboratively communicate throughout the process so that we all arrive at the best answer. Uh, so, so you have permission to make a mistake from Paul, Dawn, and Darren. Um, so don't worry about it. Um, there's plenty of other things right now to worry about. This is not a thing um, you need to spend much time on. It's great that you all want to do so well. I think that's awesome. Um, and you will. Uh, so you got to give it time, as they say, right? There's no shortcut to experience. Uh, so that's really what this is all about. Um, yeah. Every reviewer I've ever talked with has made some call to a colleague or a text to a colleague like after day one because they saw something they've never seen before or they've never done before. Um, and you'll get there too. Um, but we'll we'll provide all the support you need. Uh, so, so I don't want to say don't worry about it. I can't tell you how to feel because that's also the counselor in me. But um, uh, you're going to be okay is what I'll say. You'll, you'll be okay. Uh, Dawn or Darren, anything well, want, you want to add to that? Well, I was just going to say I want to I want to reframe a little bit, so we'll use another counseling technique. Um, I, I've heard I have heard I've heard people say <laughs> I've heard, heard people say you know doing things wrong, and the way I want to reframe is um, not so much doing things wrong, but how can I improve? Mm -hmm. So for strengths based, let's focus on. Um, you know, in the review, I tell the agencies, this is just a, you are where you are right now. You're going to get some feedback, good and um, constructive. And uh, so there's no shame in being anywhere that you are. We all start someplace, and this is about improving from wherever you're at now. And and so very much less the idea, did you do something wrong? Nope, you didn't. You did the best you could knowing what you knew. And now let's provide some additional information so you can do better. Yep. Um, so that's kind of my reframe is to try and move people away from, you know, am I doing it wrong? No, you're not. You're doing what you know how to do. And we're going to talk about some, um, you know, uh, best practice kinds of things that will help you improve. Yep. And that's a good point, Dawn. Yep. Uh, also to keep in mind as a reviewer that there really isn't a wrong way to do it. Um, people either do things according to fidelity or they don't. And if they don't do things according to, to fidelity, that's up to the agency. So if the fidelity scale says, you know, do, you know, number one, number two, number three, this way, and we get to the agency and they say, well, because of financial considerations or because of other things, we do them a different way. All that we get to say as reviewers is like, okay, I mean, that works for you, but if you want to improve your fidelity score, this is what we would recommend, period. So, mm -hmm. and Absolutely. you know, that, so there's really, I mean, it's a really safe space as a fidelity reviewer to make a recommendation because all you're recommending is that they get more in line with the fidelity scale. And at the end of all of it, 
it's up to the agency anyway. So um, mm -hmm. I'm sure there are some agencies that after Paul leaves and packs up his little you know backpack briefcase and puts his laptop away, I'm sure I walk out the door and get into my car and they say, well, thank God he left. <laughs> We're not doing anything different. <laughs> <laughs> and that's okay. You know, that's up to them. It's not up to me. I, you know, whatever. I, I'm not going to personalize any of that. Um, I try, but you know, on that note, you know, I try to be a gracious reviewer and a good, a good visitor and all of that. So I encourage you all to do the same. There's, there's just no point in. Um, uh, you'll, you'll know everything you need to do. And at the end of the day, I don't want to say it doesn't matter what the agency does because it does matter. But it only matters in so far as how it relates to the fidelity scale. Everything else they have to do, I mean, at the end of the day, it's a business decision. So um, not minimizing the scale or any of that stuff, but um, you know, these are businesses. They've got to meet a bottom line in order to keep providing services. So some of the things they're gonna do might not be fully squared in fidelity and we don't get to have an opinion on that. Um, I do wanna to mention too, uh, Paul typed in a question, when did IPS start and how did it work before IPS? Are there any other alternative, alternate programs or models used instead of IPS? So that's a big question, uh, a couple questions there, Paul. So the first thing I'll tell you is before IPS, um, you know, there were other supported employment models, sure, um, but there really weren't any that um, sort of ditched the readiness like IPS did, has. Um, you know, with old models, and I can say, because I worked at the same organization I work at today, prior to us having IPS and then after us having IPS onboarded. Um, you know, it used to be that we'd all as clinicians decide what, when someone was ready to work. And if a client said, hey, I'm thinking about work, Paul, the first thing I would do is I'd say, well, you know, you're not taking medication, you're not drinking, and you know, you showed up here and you obviously haven't showered in four days. So what I'm gonna do is sign you up for the next 12 weeks, you'll be sitting in a group where you learn how to do um, job interviewing and resume writing. And then after that 12 weeks, what have you spend six weeks, um, you know, doing skills inventories, uh, and then you'll do another six weeks after that, trying to work on your sobriety in our substance. maybe not different, but maybe look at disability populations. Um, and I guess here's what I'll tell you. Um, IPS is the most well-researched supported employment model that there is out there. Um, mm -hmm. And the research um, resoundingly identifies that it is the most effective supported employment model not just for people with disabilities, but also for people in general, as, as I said earlier about veterans. Um, right. it, it's a model that works. Uh, it's pretty commonsensical. Uh, it's, it, they say a lot, um, IPS, the IPS model is kind of how you'd help a loved one or a family member look for a job if they identified to you that they needed help finding a job. Um, and some of that pragmatism, I think, is is why it works so well. So um, I'll put in a mm -hmm. quick plug for you, Paul, um, to go check out the IPSWorks.org website. They have oodles of research available if you're into research. Um, they don't dwell a lot on what did the landscape look like before IPS, but there are some comparative um, research studies and they're pretty easy to digest if you're not somebody who's into research, uh, but they compare them to either no help, you know, no supported employment or other models. Um, and uh, so you'll you'll have a lifetime worth of reading there if you want. Um, uh, it's uh, it stood the test of time, let's put it that way. IPS in Illinois anyway, where I first learned about it, um, probably around 2002, um, when it really started to kind of enter into the conversation around um, Illinois. And uh, our state kind of did a, an overhaul at the state level to make space for it in the Department of Vocational Rehab System. Um, and we still have struggles today. There are certain counselors we work with that um, readiness, they're still in a readiness mindset. And we still have staff that, you know, um, I hate to point a finger, but sometimes prescribers, you know, they're trained that if there's a problem, I have a medication for it. Uh, and that doesn't really reconcile very well with a supported employment model that says you don't have to take your medications if you want to go look for a job. Uh, so you know there's a lot of continued education. Uh, great question, but there's a bunch of uh, bunch of resources out there for you, for sure. 
at this point, I want to just move into the uh, Fidelity Review Manual on IPSWorks.org and just talk briefly about some of these items that we're going to be scoring. Um, we may or may not get through all of these today, and that's okay. Um, if we don't get through all of them, we may quickly go through them tomorrow. Um, I don't want to spend a ton of time on these, primarily because they are very, very available for you to read on your own. Um, it'd be different if all of you were, you know, going to be fidelity reviewers starting next week, for example. I might spend way more time on these. Um, but we've had a great discussion today, and we've hit on a lot of the things that we're talk that we're going to talk about anyway. But I'd really like to spend a lot of time tomorrow um, talking to you all about the fidelity review process in general. Um, and then tomorrow we'll also have Dawn and Darren chime in on how Washington-specific sort of, uh, you know, parts of the process will look to you. Um, so that'll be good for you. And then ideally after tomorrow, you'll have reviewed the items that are scored today. Uh, and then, like I said, tomorrow we'll learn all about the fidelity review process. So ideally after tomorrow, at, at a minimum, some of those anxieties will be sort of uh, allayed a little bit, you know, kind of calmed down and you'll you'll have gone through the information, you'll have kind of talked through how it might play out um, and so that you'll feel a little bit better. <clears throat> so after that though, I think that's where um, things like obser observing um, fidelity reviews is probably the next step for a lot of folks just to see it being done by reviewers. Um, and Dawn and Darren can talk about that at any time too, um, for sure, um, how, like what the plans are going forward. Um, so let's talk about the first fidelity review item. So it's in the staffing section and it's caseload size. So remember I talked about how it's an average, right? So even though the item here says employment specialists have individual employment caseloads, period, and the maximum caseload for any employment specialist is 20 or fewer, the uh, I won't go through the rationale with you, but the way you score it, uh, just get right into, getting right into the examples, is you calculate the average caseload for the employment specialists. Um, and this allows you to have some balance so that, you know, maybe one employment specialist who's been there, you know, several years and, and well seasoned, maybe they're covering cases while newer employment specialists are kind of getting up to speed. And so the person who's been there while, the veteran, if you want to think about it that way, maybe they're the person in this first example with 25 on their caseload so that the newer person can have a little less than 20 while they're getting their legs under them. Um, but nonetheless, you know, you take the average of 25, 19, and 20, um, and the average is 21 people. Um, so let's see here. I think the scoring, yeah, to calculate the scoring, um, add the number of people who are assigned, um, and then you you average it here. That's what all of those words are. And you score it using the anchors. I'm going to find the um, here it is. I'm going to find the uh, fidelity scale and, ref and kind of flip back and forth between this. So this is the fidelity scale that I'm showing you right now. This is the fidelity manual I'm showing you right now. So it's good to flip back and forth. In If you had this in a book form, the fidelity scale is in the back of the fidelity manual, so you don't you wouldn't have to flip back and forth. But um, when I go to a review, what I usually have is a fidelity manual, and then I have for each review, each fidelity review I do, I have a, a fidelity scale like this that I print out just for that fidelity review. And so what I'll do then is this is where I take all my notes for this specific agency. I don't take any notes that are private health information or anything that's HIPAA related. I only take, you know, if, if I interview a client. I don't put the client's name, I put client says this, or you know, et cetera, et cetera. I don't, I don't do anything like that. I want this, this is the kind of thing that I'm gonna use for my notes. And so what I would do in this particular item we just reviewed, we averaged three different employment specialists, caseload sizes, and if you remember, the average came out to 21. So that means right here, our score we, we would assign is a four because four, a score of four corresponds to a ratio of 21 to 25 clients per employment specialist. Now, you may be thinking, okay, well, how, how, what would be my recommendation? My recommendation would be that, you know, the maximum is 20 clients. That's the recommendation. So the organization, since they're over 21, probably needs to figure out how do we um, shuffle the caseloads so that the average is 20, or there's also this argument out there. I can't tell an organization this, but if if caseloads are higher than 20, 
there may be an argument for them to hire another employment specialist. If everybody's got 25 on their caseload and you got three employment specialists, five from specialist one, five from specialist two, five from specialist three equals 15 on a new employment specialist caseload. Now, again, that's a business decision hiring somebody, so I would never recommend it. Um, but the fidelity scale is the fidelity scale. Maximum caseload is 20 or fewer. We give them a four because that's what the math tells us to do. And if the organization comes back at you and says, yeah, but you know, why is it a four? We think it should be a five. We just we just show them the math and say, this is this is what the score, we have to score you in this range because of the averages, period. Um, it doesn't have to be, uh, you know, like I said, it doesn't have to be contentious or anything like that. Um, and I think we've got a question, and after all this time, I don't know how to field a question. Uh, so Dawn and Darren, if you could help me uh, with that, I would appreciate it. Can absolutely help with that one. Um, the scenario is, and this is this is um, based on Washington State only, so it's not a, anything else. Amerigroup um, has told agencies not to close people if they quit showing up to let them age off in regards to their authorization period. So the only people we consider inactive are those people that aren't coming in anymore, and maybe they've said they you know don't want employment services right now. But you're keeping, well, uh, no, excuse me, let me back up. They haven't said that they don't want services. They just aren't contacting you. And Amerigroup has said you, ha said you have to keep them open until they age off. Those are the only ones that we would consider inactive. So it's, it's to not penalize agencies for the Amerigroup policy, if that makes sense. Um, and then, yes, Hallie, it's the, the active clients. Does that, did, did I? Darren, chime in if I did a poor job of explaining because I feel like I fumbled up on that one. No, no, I think this is, you know, it, it is a little tricky with Washington. I think you did a, a good job, Don, because um, when I was running a program, I tried to um, close people's fears and, um, you know, it's a very difficult process. Um, so we understand that here in Washington, we're operating under the foundational community supports and working with, you know, a mayor group TPA, you know, to uh, maintain those authorized tiers until they, you know, um, expire. So we know there's going to be a few people, um, like you said, that agencies have tried to engage with, um, and they may still be on that client list for an employment specialist. Um, so that's that kind of important information when we look at data and we look at caseloads that, you know, people are aware and can tell us as reviewers, because if we just look at a page, we might not be aware of the situation going on simultaneously while the review is going on. So we really rely on the employment specialist and the supervisor manager to educate us about what the caseload is like. Those are great points. Um, and it's worth noting too, that one of the things that's really good for a fidelity review team to kind of check in on the organization with on day one is how they define things like active, inactive, uh, because that'll come up mm -hmm. in this particular item as well. So this is a good conversation to have. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I'll note too is as a fidelity reviewer you're really rating IPS fidelity according to IPS fidelity so um, not to say that you um, discount the information that Don and Darren just shared um, you know but at the end of the day you know there's no there's no space in the IPS fidelity manual for you know state specific uh, differences, you know, whether it's funding sources or whatever. And so it's just, and this is something that every state sort of struggles with in their own way is, you know, at some point, I, it's inherently good that IPS is in a state period. So there's always going to be little wrinkles in, in how it looks from state to state, state to state. So um, it's just worth the discussion. Um, you know, I'll, I'll put out there too, the Fidelity scale here, the Fidelity manual, I should say, it doesn't really di differentiate between active and inactive cases. Um, so that's something that we all have brought to the table as providers. Um, so it's just interesting. Now it has this sort of um, 
bulleted list here. Many IPS specialists keep both a caseload list of people who are participating in the program and people who do not regularly meet with them. Uh, it says they should have just one caseload list, and the following guidelines will help programs define caseloads in a consistent manner. Um, so within the confines of these bullet points here are, are sort of how we can define, according to you know IPS fidelity anyway, um, all those sort of wrinkles of active versus inactive. I, I was in a state one time that had um, a state sort of grant process that supported IPS, and the agency I was at had that that had a particular name. Let's just I don't know. We'll call it. Um, I'm gonna call it. Uh, you know, I'm gonna call it uh, Fender because I like playing guitar and I think Fender guitars are great. Uh, so the name of the program was Fender, for example this grant that supported IPS. So this agency did IPS services for clients that were in Fender, that were kind of enrolled in that grant, and they also provided IPS services for clients that, I'm sorry, they did not provide IPS, they provided a different form of supported employment for clients that were not in the Fender grant. And so as you might imagine, as Fidelity Reviewers, we had to really sort out, so if I'm here to do an IPS fidelity review. I'm here to review all of your employment work. Um, so, you know, they're sitting there telling us that I've got a caseload of 18 for non-Fender, but 20 for Fender. And so as fidelity review team, we really had to figure out, does that mean their caseload's 38 or do we only review the 20 that are assigned to the, the Fender grant? And it was very complicated mm -hmm. and very tough to sort out. Um, and we ended up kind of giving two recommendations basically that, so like here's your sort of Fender Grant Fidelity score. And then if the Fender Grant wasn't a thing and this is just how you did business, this is what your Fidelity score would be. And it was significantly different as you might imagine. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, it's nice tricky. It. Yeah, every mm -hmm. state is tricky and it has its own sort of elements that are just part of how it's, how the infrastructure of it. And so it's not right or wrong, but that's just something the reviewers just have to sort out. Well, there's a couple of good questions about, um, well, they're all good questions, but a couple of questions that relate to wait list. Okay. Um, one about caseload size and then one about job coaching versus job developer in different uh, positions. So three more questions that, that uh, are kind of relevant to the moment. Sure. Uh, Although, so the first one here, go ahead. Whether you, go ahead. Whether you answer or whether you answer when we get to that particular fidelity item. Yeah, we can just go ahead and try them right now. Uh, so the first one from Harrison here, what would you recommend for having only one supported employment specialist and their caseload is starting to get past 20? Would you recommend a wait list? So let me just answer these kind of as they come up. So um, so there's a lot of things you could recommend. Um, so again, from a fidelity reviewer's perspective, I think there's a big difference between having a caseload of 21 and having a caseload of like 29. Uh, so um, you know, the details are important in this particular one. Um, a wait list is an option. Some organizations do that. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, um, it, some organizations really view caseloads getting over 20 as evidence they can provide to leadership that shows they need to onboard an additional, or at least a part-time uh, employment specialist to support the extra caseload. Um, but not everybody can just hire, you know, willy-nilly, especially after the last 12 months, I think, that we all went through. So um, whether it's a reasonable recommendation or not, it's kind of up to the organization. So there's a couple things, a couple options, I would say. And then I guess the third option on that, too, is some agencies have, um, you know, let, let's just use that example, 29 people on a caseload. And while it's not, it's not a five, you know, again, if you remember that uh, fidelity is flexible, if they had 29 on a caseload and there's one person, they'd have a score of three. Um, yes, that will impact their overall fidelity score, but it's it could be that they still have a score for the agency that is in line with fidelity. They just scored a three on this particular item. So for an agency, they may make no changes. Um, and, and that's okay too. Uh, so don't get hung up on if it's not a five, it's not a good score because a three is a good score. And if people have to have a caseload of 29 because that's circumstances, dick, that's what they have to do, then that is fine. Uh, again, it's not there for me to say good or bad. It's 
for the agency to decide, can we do it? So um, a lot of options there. And then Harrison goes on here. If I have some clients who are not really showing up and clients who should, who are, should I keep putting more clients on the wait uh, or wait for the ones who are not participating to age out before adding more clients to the caseload? Um, you know, some of this I think is an organizational approach. So my organization has sort of a, a policy and a procedure for what to do when people sort of start to withdraw from services. Um, and we do have a particular item coming up, time unlimited support in the fidelity items that kind of gives you some guidance here. Uh, but at the end of the day, um, you know, your organization, I know this is kind of a non-answer, Harrison, but this your organization is going to kind of have to do what makes the most sense for your organization. Um, so uh, we and we can talk more about that on break if you want to, or um, when we get to the other time unlimited items. Um, Bobby says, so if I have 20 people on my caseload and 10 aren't coming in for services, what then? Well, um, again, the it doesn't really say active or inactive in the fidelity manual. It just says the average of people on your caseload has to be for a five has to be 20 or fewer. So um, I guess to specifically answer your question, what then? So uh, if you're the only employment specialist, you'd get a score of a five because you have 20 people on your caseload and that's the maximum. Um, and you can see where a lot of this is up to how the organization maybe defines things, right? Um, uh, and so, and at the end of the day, the organization is going to provide to you whatever they think the list is. So if they, if I walk in as a reviewer and you give me your caseload list, Bobby, and it has 10 people on it, I don't even know about the 10 people that aren't coming in for services. There's no way I could know it. So, um, see, this is part of what agencies get to identify to us. Um, at least I'm, I'm not aware in Washington that there's like a central place you know, like Dawn, where, where a reviewer could go find out caseload sizes for any provider in the state. That doesn't, I don't think I've heard you mention that before. Well, there, there kind of is. Um, uh, the Amerigroup, um, Amerigroup has a, a report that they published that talks about, that it addresses caseload size per, per employment specialist kinds of a thing. But it's not something we go back and look at. We don't compare it against the Fidelity Review. The Fidelity Review is the Fidelity Review, and, and we're looking at agency documentation when we're doing that. So it's not something we go and check and say, oh, you know, this one says they have 25 per caseload and the agency's reporting 20. We don't do that. Right. And, um, you know, I did want to go ahead. relate to the wait, wait list mm -hmm. um, that I think it's the zero exclusion item has a caveat that says if you have a wait list, that kind of is excluding. Yep. <laughs> and, and so you can't score as high on zero exclusion if you have a wait list. Yep, um, definitely. Uh, I was going to chime in too that that state I had mentioned where they have like the the fender grant and the non you know the non fender work. Um, another tricky part to that those reviews was that there was a I don't even remember the name of it, but there was some sort of computer platform, almost like a portal, where every IPS provider had to go in and enter data. And as a fidelity reviewer, the expectation was that prior to the fidelity review, you would run reports in this portal and have all the information you would need for the organization when you showed up to the review. The the organization wouldn't have to provide really anything to you. You would come armed with it. And it was a, a real bear because um, if the agency didn't update it regularly as a fidelity reviewer, you'd be walking in with a six month old list for caseloads. And oh. I mean, it was just a uh, just a, a nightmare, as you might imagine. It was it was very difficult, very unwieldy. Um, Rebecca put in here, my agency separates job coaches from job developers, so I work closely with the job developers as they find jobs for my clients as I work with them on other pre-employment needs. Has this set up and evaluated and does this affect my agency's fidelity score? Um, so I would bet it would affect the agency's score. Um, it may affect the agency's score. I think it probably a lot depends on, you know, what you'd hear in interviews when you're at that at the agency and so if there's an item for example that talks about vocational generalists and it says that you know basically there's evidence that each employment specialist does all of the aspects of the job search so i i would ask a lot of questions about you know so what do the job coaches do when they're not job coaching and what do the job developers do when they're not job developing um to try to get a feel for that um 
And I don't know that a setup such as this has been evaluated that I've seen. I'm sure, you know, there are agencies that are set up in a similar way across America. Um, and I want you to just remember that um, just because it affects your agency's score doesn't mean that it's bad. Again, every agency is a business and they have to do what they have to do. Um, so um, I'm not going to show up there and wag my finger at you or make a tisk tisk noise or anything. If that's just how you have it set up because that's the way it needs to be set up, um, then then that's you do you. And I'm just going to tell you how that setup relates to the fidelity scale. Uh, and then, you know, pending the final report, your organization will just get to make some some decisions. Do we want to change it or not in order to increase our fidelity score? Um, and, and you all will hear me answer that and hear Dawn and Darren answer in that way over the next couple of days here, because that's really what it comes down to is, you know, the fidelity scale, while it seems like it's very prescriptive, it's, it's a guide and every agency can do whatever they want um, or whatever they have to do. And our job is just, just to kind of like check the list, like is, is what you're doing IPS fidelity, yes or no? And there's a lot of variability, right? You can have a bunch of things that aren't scored a five on the fidelity scale and still have fidelity to the IPS model, even though you have differences compared to an agency that let's say has a perfect score or something or a very, very high score. And it's not wrong, it's not wrong at all. It's just that agencies have to do different things because of different arrangements and um, and at some point, you know, the, you, everybody has to appreciate that a fidelity reviewer pops in once a year to take a look um, and all of the other days of the year the agency has to figure it out without the reviewers right so um, <laughs> so uh, I don't want to go so far as to say you know the fidelity scale isn't really important to an agency because it is if you want to provide good high quality services that have great outcomes um, but at the end of it all too there's an awful lot of flexibility within fidelity uh, for folks. Sure. So um, don't get hung up on, sure. I, I don't score a five. Don't get hung up on that. It's it's it, it's okay. There are agencies that do great work that have scored a one on particular items. And 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 that's okay too. And I wanted to say too, Paul, that um, historically the state of Washington, prior to using IPS, um, had a an employment rate um, for people with, with serious mental illness, because, you know, that's kind of what we're measuring at this point in time. Um, it, because 94% of the people being served by, by IPS have a diagnosable mental illness. So regardless of whatever the other challenges are that they have, that really is the population that we're all serving. They, you know, in some ways they have a diagnosable uh, mental illness. And so historically the placement rate uh, was like about 14% of people with serious mental illness were, were getting jobs in the state of Washington. Um, I just saw statistics related to IPS, and this is IPS throughout the United States where it's being used in the 26 different states, um, that uh, using IPS, um, hopefully to fidelity, the placement rate is about 42.3%. Mm -hmm. So the bottom line is, if you use it to fidelity, you're more likely to help people get and maintain jobs. That's the bottom line. That's what we're hoping Absolutely. for. And, Absolutely. And it's proven. In per the data that that's that's what's happening. Yep. And and on that note, Don, I pulled up the PowerPoint slide deck. The fidelity scoring, when you add all of the fidelity items together, um, you know, a perfect score is 125. Um, but if you score a 74, you have fidelity to IPS. You you have fidelity to the model. The lowest possible fidelity score is 74, and that's not bad. Anywhere between 74 and 125 means you have fidelity. And just because, you know, somebody's got good fidelity or exemplary fidelity instead of fair fidelity doesn't mean they do it better or anything like that. This scoring doesn't, doesn't, uh, at no point in a fidelity review will we score an organization based on their employment outcomes. Right. So you could have a score of 74, which is the lowest score in the range of fidelity and have tremendous outcomes you could really rock it at getting people employed and keeping them employed so fidelity is fidelity don't get hung up on the fives on the scale everybody does every time we do this dawn and darren and i um, answer questions that are similar to this what if this happens or what if we have it set up this way um, and that's okay it's good for you to ask those questions because you're thinking like a reviewer 
Um, but don't get hung up on, well, darn, we're not a five. Um, it, it's okay if you're not a five. Uh, in fact, um, there's what, 25 items on the scale, right? Or am I wrong about that? Um, no, yeah. Yeah, we use the 25 item scale. Yep, 25 items on the scale. So um, I'm not, again, I'm a counselor, so take this math with a grain of salt. But if there's 25 <laughs> items on the scale and you get a three on every single one, I think you're going to get a 75. Is that right? That's right. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so, you know, there's a lot of flexibility for people within the confines of fidelity. Um, and so I can't I can't say enough. Uh, you know, don't don't heap your your uh, valuation of the work you're doing as good or bad based on any one item score, because um, it's only until you look at the totality of it that you really get a picture of where they where an agency's at in fidelity. So if you're in an interview mm -hmm. and somebody says something and the first thing that you think is, well, I remember reading that in the fidelity manual and now I'm going to have to score them a one. You know, you don't you have to manage your nonverbals because I don't want to say it doesn't mean anything, but like it it fits into the greater discussion as opposed to just the one item discussion. You'll still score that one item, whatever you have to score it. But it's not the end of the world. I mean, it's it's not it's OK. Mm -hmm. There's still room in the scale for people to kind of rebound and have a, a good score for sure. Um, and then real quickly, I want to mention here, Christy puts in here, can you talk about a wait list and how should that be set up as to not be a barrier? Um, Dawn mentioned it. She identified it right out of the gates here. There, There is some specific language in the no exclusion item that we'll get to that talks about how wait lists are, how they're regarded with regards to scoring. And, and I'll tell you the same thing we talked about in some of these other questions. As an organization, you have to set it up however you have to set it up. So if it, there are organizations that have wait lists because there's no other option for them. Um, and they just tell us about it. And as reviewers, we we score it and we move on. Um, and of course, our recommendation is that, you know, you should really try to figure out a way to get rid of your waiting list. Um, but, you know, <laughs> the agency knows we're going to recommend that right out of the gates. I, I guarantee it. Um, that That is not a surprise recommendation. Um, so um, those are all of the sort of things. You all are doing a really good job at asking questions that I feel like come up much later for some other groups we've been in front of, Dawn and Darren. Um, so um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very impressed yep. with the questions, but don't get too hung up on it has to be a five or what, like it's okay. Even if you get a score of a one on caseload size and you got somebody with 41 clients on their caseload, um, you gotta do what you gotta do. And every organization has to do what they have to do. Um, all we would recommend then as fidelity reviewers is you really need to get that employment specialist help, um, however you can. Even if you obligate half of an existing staff member to employment, you know, that's better than, um, and, and those are discussions you'd have over your two-day fidelity review anyway. Sure. And one of the things that I would mention too, Paul, is both Darren and I work for agencies. Both of us carried a caseload. Both, both of us have gone through fidelity reviews in regards to, or, or I should say in addition to being now fidelity reviewers, um, both of us are available to do training and consultation with agencies to, um, you know, help to teach about fidelity and things you might consider and yeah. uh, so individualized basis. So um, keep in mind too, as you're asking questions that if you ever feel like you want a training from us to get into more depth on a specific item or two or three or whatever, we're happy to do that too. Yeah, that's a good tip. Um, and you know, you all have resources as providers in Dawn and Darren, so you know, access them as it's appropriate. And then the other thing to remember too, and I know we've said it, but I'll say it again, as you know, future Fidelity reviewers, there are also resources for you for that too. Um, now, none of us know it all, but you know, chances mm -hmm. are you do enough reviews, you start to see an awful lot of it. Um, so uh -huh. um, they, Darren and Dawn have seen it, um, and chances are there's some other provider struggling with it too. So um, that's just kind of the way it goes, I think, is what I've noticed. So that was a good robust discussion about our first item. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so what I think maybe is appropriate is we all take about, I don't know, eight to 10 minute break here kind of exhale a little bit. I feel like everybody's anxiety went up a little bit and then came down. So <laughs> get up and you know walk around your house or office a little bit. 
do some stretches. Um, let's come back, like I said, about eight to 10 minutes, and we're gonna start moving through the fidelity scale, and you'll have more questions, spoiler alert, and that's okay. Dawn and Darren and I will answer them. Um, and then we'll just keep moving through this today, um, taking break by break by break, and then I will see you in about eight to 10 minutes.
All right, I'm going to just double check. Um, looks like we have a few more questions that have been added during break here. Um, this is a great group asking yeah, excellent questions. I, I agree. And I don't mean to impugn other groups, Dawn and Darren. I, I just think the, the level of questions here, and I'm not blowing smoke, the level of questions here is on a, it's just it's just a different level than I think we've had in the past. Mm -hmm. And that's well, great. Well, and part of it may be that we're doing things a smidgen differently today than we've done. We're putting a little more emphasis on some things. And your question about what makes you nervous about fidelity reviews was just, Spectacular, I have to say that that yeah. actually really got the conversation going. So it did. It kind um, of opened up the floodgates, didn't it? <laughs> it did. So go, Paul. We definitely wow. need to ask that one again. That's all my training as a jazz musician. No, it's shooting, shooting from the cuff there, uh, <laughs> shooting from the hip. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I thought that was really good, Paul. <laughs> got a lot of great discussion. I always, I thank you. I always wonder if there's somebody out there kind of chewing on their fingernails about all of this that we're talking about. So that was what really kind of stimulated it. Um, mm -hmm. Bobby, Bobby put into the uh, question bar there. I understand we need to keep them active, but if I have more time to work with more people due to some not seeing me, how does that work? Kind of the same that we talked about at the end of the day, whatever an organization produces as the caseload list, is kind of what we're going to regard in terms of that first item, caseload size. Uh, so each organization has the flexibility to put it together however they need to put it together. Um, and, I, and I feel like I understand where, where you're coming from with this, Bobby. I mean, there are some people that kind of, they show up and they, they're, you know, they're really ready to find a job and hot and heavy. And then after a couple of weeks when the job that they thought they'd get immediately isn't quite there yet, um, you know, maybe they get, other things happen in their life they're distracted by other things and so they start to taper off of a little bit but you know those are the same people that i know because i've done some of the work here those are the same people that 90 days later show up again hot and heavy you know so like taking them off of your caseload doesn't seem as practical as keeping them on to kind of ride that wave so i under i definitely understand what you're saying um and so i don't think darren and dawn and i are talking about you know, the boots on the ground, this is how you should set it up as much as we're saying, this is how Fidelity views it. Um, so I, I really I really want you to think about um, with regards to, you know, kind of the questions you're asking about caseload size and active and inactive, not so much about what do I do or how does that work, but think about how does, how does that work for Fidelity it is kind of like the two words I'd add to your question. Um, so for Fidelity, you know, we're going to come in and look at your caseload, whatever the caseload is that the organization puts puts on paper in front of us. So um, if they're active, if they're inactive, you know, we may not really know all of that detail unless you provide it. Um, and so that, you know, kind of becomes its own sort of um, not to sound. Oh, what's the word? Not not to have too much gamesmanship to it, but it, it kind of ends up becoming a strategy, I think, for providers is a, is a good way for me to put it. So. Um, everybody that is on this call and every IPS provider in America right now has a portion of people that they're working with that are names on paper and they haven't talked with in a period of time. I, I, I will tell you that much. Everybody does. Um, that, that's just the work that we're doing. Um, so I think we're good on time to kind of get back at it. So I'm going to move into employment services staff. Uh, this is the second item under the services. Um, um, staffing, I'm sorry, I knew I didn't have it right. <laughs> Second item under the staffing section. Um, and this really just looks at employment specialists providing only employment services. Uh, we're gonna get this information from interviews and from what people tell us, um, both the employment specialist and the supervisors. I'll skip over the rationale, um, but the idea is employment specialists work best when they're only providing employment functions. Uh, and if you go over to the scoring rubric here, um, what you're gonna do is just try to arrive at a percentage. And it, it, in agencies where it's, I always think the, the ones of the scoring and the fives of the scoring are always the easiest ones to know. Either something is completely absent or it's it's there way less than, you know, it needs to be for a five, or you can find no evidence that it doesn't exist, you know, or that it, that it is not there, you know, that it's, def it's definitely there. So for this one, um, 
most agencies, you're going to have an employment specialist that works only on employment and, you know, the case management type things that they do are really incidental and they're uh, related to um, the employment anyway. So you may find a note from an employment specialist, for example, that is taking somebody to get their uh, ID card. Um, which is, you know, it's like a case management type function, but it's so that they can have identification for when they start their new job, you know, that has a start date in two weeks or something like that. So in the context of employment, it makes a lot of sense that an employment specialist would provide a case management service because it's related to work. Um, so that would be a five, you know, if that was the only employment specialist and they were, that was the only thing they were doing. Um, what this item really wants to guard against is somebody, let's say, maybe being a half-time employment specialist and a half-time case manager. And the reason that the, the people who put IPS together kind of wanted to guard against that is, um, I think we know that if you're a case manager and let's say you've got a full day of, well, we'll just, split it in half. Let's say in the morning you're scheduled to do case management work and in the afternoon you're scheduled to do employment services work. What do you think happens when a crisis walks in the door from your caseload in the afternoon? You drop the employment services stuff to do the crisis. It's historically what happens with a lot of agencies. So we're really trying to just guard against, um, you know, sharing time with other stuff, um, uh, because it's, um, we want employment specialists to work on employment, uh, places that have the best outcomes, um, have it set up in that way. Um, so uh, I'm trying to think of other things. I don't think this one has any sentences that stick out to me that I had an asterisk by. Um, so here in small well, amount, they say, go ahead. I'm sorry, Paul. I was just going to say back when the 1915 B3 waiver went away in the state of Washington, and the agency that I work for decided to keep the supported employment program, which a lot of agencies didn't. They made me a case manager and said, your specialty will be employment. Mm -hmm. And I will say my real live experience was when somebody came in and their meds had been stolen or they needed to go to the food bank or they were going to lose their housing or, you know, anyone, you know, the police was going to pick them up for some reason or they were being abused against. All of those things took precedence because in the scheme of life, they were emergent and immediate, and I really didn't do any employment services, I, I, you know, sure. truly none. <laughs> Just really, all the other stuff took precedence. So yep. um, I can tell you from a real life experience kind of standpoint, it makes perfect sense not to do more than one job. It makes sense to do the employment specialist only. Yep. And and it says here in the Fidelity Manual, Dawn, uh, to your point that, um, you know, we understand that it says here, all, uh, although the split position may be practical, the fidelity standard remains constant and is not adjusted for different situations. So, um, again, the fidelity scale and the fidelity reviewers aren't judging whether or not Dawn's scenario is right or wrong. We're just saying, well, you know, in regards to fidelity, we think it would be best if you were just focused on employment or case management, one or the other, not both. Um, but at the end, like we said before, at the end of all of it, each agency gets to make a decision, right, based on the business that they have. So um, that one is fairly straightforward. Um, and again, to calculate the score, you're really just looking for a percentage. Um, this one may be a tough one for you to get a, a, a definitive percentage on, especially, believe it or not, especially in an organiza organization where they have employment specialists that really don't do case management, but to be fair, I mean, when I'm doing a fidelity review and that's the case, I just kind of, after talking with them, if, if it's very clear to me that there's no other function they provide beyond employment, I just scored a five and I don't really worry about the percentage um, because you, it's hard. To, there's no there's no real way to calculate it if you want to think about it that way, where you'll really spend a lot of time discussing it and going back and forth on it and trading notes on interviews uh, is when people are splitting time between, like Dawn said, case management and employment. You'll you'll really ask a lot of questions about, okay, well, let's look at your calendar. How much time did you do, you know, on Monday? What of this is employment? And, you know, you'll see two appointments. Okay, what about Tuesdays? Five appointments. Okay. And then as you start to walk through a week or two of their calendar, you might be able to arrive at a maybe a rough percentage of how much of their time is spent on employment. Um, but beyond that, you know, 
Uh, if, you, if you're interviewing somebody who's a case manager assigned to employment, chances are, um, you know, they're, you, they're not going to have a five or a four. So you'd be kind of trying to exclude things uh, in the three and the two and the one category to see which one is the best fit. Uh, item three here is vocational generalists. Uh, and it says each employment specialist carries out all phases of employment services, including intake, engagement, assessment, job placement, job coaching, and follow along supports before step down to less intensive employment support from another mental health practitioner. So there was a question earlier, right, about um, we have some people who are job coaches, some people who are job developers. You know, how would how would we regard that in um, in the fidelity scale? And so if you go to number three here. Um, you're looking for each employment specialist um, to carry out all phases of employment. Um, so basically we would wanna, through our interviews, figure out where this organization lines up in the scale of scoring here. So a five would be each employment specialist carries out all six phases. So in that example, we know that's not accurate. Um, so then we just start walking it back from there. So do people do five, yes or no? If they don't do five, do we think they do one to four phases? And maybe that's the most accurate. And, and please don't share any additional detail because I don't want to have I don't want anybody to arrive at a score for their organization through this training. Um, but just based on what was shared, we might start moving towards a three because it seems like employment specialists provide one to four phases of the employment service. Um, and the questioning then would really be. Um, kind of confirming some of that maybe, uh, really finding out, well, okay, so you do job development. What do you do when they're not, when you're not job developing? Um, and so that may be, well, I'll do, you know, if, if anybody walks in today and needs a vocational assessment, I'll do that. Or, uh, so, okay, so there's a second function, you know, so you start to piece it together that way to arrive at a score. And it starts to kind of um, become a little bit more clear, I think, um, as you have the discussion with the employees. So um, so this is a, a good example of something from our questions that you could um, you could roughly score today. Again, not knowing additional detail, of course, but um, the thing about the Fidelity Manual too that I, I think I neglected to mention that's very cool is it provides these examples um, of, of the way things might look in certain places and how you'd score it and um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I think, um, it's worth going through this and you know this is not like a, a book you can pick it up and read it cover to cover in one sitting or in a couple sittings and, and expect to remember all of it or anything like that so i'd encourage you to pick it up and maybe just start at you know pick it up and read through one item uh, at a time and then just kind of make notes in there or put a sticky note in there for questions you'd want to ask next time you see dawn or darren or paul and um you know underline something highlight something, whatever is going to make sense to you. Um, one of the things that we'll note um, is it's got a great example in this one here of how you regard it when you have an organization where one employment specialist carries out all six phases and a second one carries four phases and a third one does um, one part. So the short answer is you score each individual employment specialist alone and then you kind of put them together. And the reason I want to bring it up is we'll see this more often in the fidelity manual. If you get an uh, an item like this with that scores 3.6, there are many, many places in this fidelity manual where the recommendation is actually that you'd score a three and not a four. It's not rounded up to four, it's rounded down to three because three is the, mo the score, it's the score that they have satisfied completely they have not yet satisfied all of the requirements to score a four until they get to 4.0 so even if you put all this math together and you divide it by three and it's a 3.9 um, you would score you would round down so that you can give them credit for the score they have most completely met the criteria for does that make sense I think everybody's muted, so I, I don't know if people are saying yes or if they're saying no, but if you have a question about it, please feel free to uh, pop it into the, the questions bar. Um, I'm just gonna keep kind of moving through this too. Um, so in the organization section, we're now in kind of the second section of the Fidelity Manual. Integration of rehabilitation with mental health treatment 
through team assignment. So if you remember in the very beginning, we talked about if you're working at an organization or you're doing a fidelity review at an organization that doesn't have a mental health treatment team, you're gonna try to help them identify for you uh, what is the most relevant team for their organization. I gave you a few examples, um, uh, and, and there's you know a myriad of examples. Um, you know, uh, let's see here. Staff from clubhouses and community rehab providers that coordinate services with other mental health agencies may be unable to improve this score for this item. Um, so if you're somebody who doesn't have a mental health treatment team, but you get referrals from an organization that's a mental health organization, Fidelity reviewers might be asking you, do you interact and integrate with that team, even though it's an external agency? And that's gonna be really hard for you probably uh, because you know it requires that organization to kind of accept you into their their milieu. Um, uh, so that gets to be a tricky part. The examples are the best part of this item. Um, fairly straightforward on the first one, an agency has three mental health treatment teams and one IPS specialist. The specialist attends each team meeting and receives referrals from all three teams. 30% of their caseload is from the first team, 30 from the second, and 40 from the third team. The score for this item is three because 70% of the people on the IPS specialist caseload are from two mental health treatment teams. So reason that's important, I know there's a question out there. This item um, says kind of two things. One is that employment specialists are part of up to two mental health treatment teams. And the second portion is from which at least 90% of the employment specialist's caseload is comprised. So if they're connected to three teams uh, and they have 90%, they're still not going to get a five. Um, uh, in that example, now that I've given myself that example, I got to figure out how would we score that. So they'd get a two because they're attached to three or more treatment teams. Um, so it seems like could be good based on 90% of the referrals coming from the teams because they're assigned to more than two teams kind of defaults them to a two. This is why having the fidelity manual present while you're doing a fidelity review is really important um, because it helps you uh, frame up all of these different ways it could happen. Um, let me do one more example and then I'll flip over to the question here. Um, here's a good one. Uh, Clubhouse provides evidence-based supported employment as part of its array of employment services. In general, clubhouses do not provide mental health treatment and at the, this clubhouse, the three IPS specialists are each assigned to two mental health treatment teams at a nearby mental health center from which 90% of their caseloads are compri comprised reviewers score of five. Um, so this is a good one for you to know too, because this this particular item on the fidelity manual scale, um, it doesn't regard anything like the frequency of team meetings or anything like that. That's actually scored in another item. This really just counts how many teams are you assigned to and how, much, how many of your referrals come from those two teams. Um, so another good first day activity is for you to have the organization help you understand um, exactly what the teams are. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of times it's really blurry how the teams are organized and they'll call different teams different names and sometimes the same team a different name because it's part of a bigger team, et cetera, et cetera. So um, you really wanna spend a couple minutes just really understanding how's everything organized, who reports to who, um, and that sort of thing. Um, let's see here, Harrison uh, says, assuming they are but not but just wanted to double check for clarification. Um, are the supported employment and supportive housing programs checked under the same fidelity? So first question, uh, I'll stop right there. So supported housing has its own fidelity scale, which is different from IPS supported employment. Um, and I think, I'm sure Donna Darren can provide some insight onto that one. Um, and then the, also if scored differently, will the fidelity scores from one program affect the other? Um, short answer on that one is probably maybe. Um, so in an example um, where instead of a mental health treatment team, somebody's working with an employment specialist is assigned to a supportive housing treatment team. Um, if if they're assigned to a supportive housing treatment team, but you know uh, less than 90% of the referrals come from that team, that would affect the score. There's a couple other items we'll get to about frequency of of uh, meetings and that sort of thing that it might affect it in that way. Um, but Dawn and Darren, I don't know if you want to chime in on how supportive housing is is kind of scored differently with a different scale in Washington. 
Yeah, this is Darren. I can just jump in and that they're both SAMHSA uh, evidence-based practices, definitely with Weststat and IPS, it's a different rigorous model, with more academia-based. Um, I have not gone through the supportive housing uh, review process, so I'm not really familiar with that, but they, they, the originations are both evidence-based out of SAMHSA, and there's definitely more information there as well, but then uh, Westat and IPS uh, definitely has a lot of additional researches and ongoing research, you know, right now uh, process to continually hone in the um, IPS model. Definitely. Um, I think I saw one more question pop in. Can I define what, can you define what you mean by teams? I get 100% of my referrals from my same agency, but get referrals from the different departments like our therapy, SUD, and our case managers. Will that put the fidelity low for the program? So great question, Harrison. These are real examples here you're providing, and so let's just use those. So um, I don't define the team. The agency defines the teams for me when I come in. Um, so I'll just use your example. So let's say you get 100% of your referrals from these three teams, therapy, SUD team, and case, I'll just say case management. In this scenario, if these were all real, uh, you would get, you would get sort of um, in this area here, uh, you would have more than 90% of your employment specialist caseload comprised from the teams that you're associated with, but you'd be part of uh, three, it sounds like, mental health treatment teams. So this is similar to one of the examples I gave. So we would have to score it here. Employment specialists are attached to three or more teams. And, and it's not good. To treatment teams. How about, can we score to four? Well, the only thing really changed here is the percentage. It's still one. We know you're attached to three, and this is Paul, even though I'm using brought up, so I'm not saying this is definitively your score. And how about, can we score to three? Well, again, the percentage changed, but not the number of teams. This one still says one to two mental health treatment teams, and we know there's three in play. So, this walks us all the way back to two. Employment specialists are attached to two or three, to three or more mental health treatment teams. So only based on information you shared, I would say without anything else, um, I, I couldn't score higher than a two um, because th that's the confines of the fidelity score, um, if that makes sense. Um, so, so what I would do is I would, I would come into your organization, anybody's organization, and on day one, I would say, okay, great. So, you know, Harrison, talk to me about, you know, who's the, who's the employment specialist here and who are, who's the IPS supervisor and um, does the IPS supervisor report to somebody and if so, who's that and are they a member of the ex executive team? And it, real quickly, I'm starting to put together like an org chart of the organization so I know kind of how everything's assembled and, maybe in an individual interview with you, Harrison, we'd be talking and you'd be telling me how you do your job and you'd kind of identify that, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm, let's say I'm attached to three teams, therapy, SUD team, and case management team. But then let's say that you tell me the therapy and case management teams, all they both report to the same person and they both meet together as one team meeting. So in that way, I might tell you, like, I think we should consider that one team um, instead of two because they meet together, they report to the same person. Um, so it's it'd be different, I think, if you went to a therapy meeting, you went to an SUD team meeting, and then you went to a case manager team meeting. And again, not good or bad, um, but it is, it is just the way, uh, you know, an organization would be set up. So great question, great question. Um, the other thing I want to point out again is these sample questions. So for those of you that were kind enough to kind of express some of those anxieties earlier about I'm afraid I, you know, I, I will say the wrong thing or not get the right thing, it's got these sample questions there. So when you're talking with the IPS specialist, you can just ask these, who refers people to you? And they give you an answer. Okay, anyone else? Um, 
So, uh, and in one of the appendices of the fidelity manual is literally just a full uh, gamut of questions by entity. So like you'd have IPS specialist, and then let's say about a page worth of potential questions you could ask them. And it even walks it over into which item on the fidelity scoring sheet it corresponds to. So they make it very easy, I promise. I don't have any sort of, um, you know, super wizardry that, that I possess and you don't possess and, you know, no offense, Dawn and Darren, but they don't either. All, all that's happened is they're, they've gone through something like you're all going through right now and they've observed a bunch um, and the training plus the observation uh, has led them to, you know, try out Fidelity Reviews and it, it's just all about experience and, and what you've seen and kind of um, getting the reps in if you want to think about it that way. So you all are equipped to do this, I promise. This is another one where you're going to round down. So if you do um, any sort of um, averaging, because um, you determine the score, this is another one where you determine the score for each employment specialist um, and then average it. So if you get 3.6, you have to remember you can't round up to four. You got to round down to three because that's the closest one that they've fully met um, uh, to score them fairly. Now, another way to look at integration here is with this item two, integration um, with the mental health treatment team or relevant treatment team through frequent team member contact. This one is one that's like a lot of others here. They have to meet certain criteria that they've articulated in these bullet points. And so basically for each bullet point, they're gonna get a point. So um, they'll get a point if the employment specialist attends the weekly mental health treatment team meeting that they're assigned to. So you would not get this point if the treatment team meeting doesn't happen weekly. Um, you would get not get credit for this point if, um, yeah, well, that's a good one. I'll stop right there. Uh, I'll make it more confusing if I keep going. Um, so yeah, if the team doesn't meet weekly, you'll see in a few minutes here, we don't give credit, full credit for this because they don't meet weekly. Um, second bullet point, uh, the specialist participates actively in treatment team meetings with shared decision making. Um, the employment services documentation is integrated into the client's treatment record or chart or medical record. Uh, the office is in close proximity to the treatment teams that they're assigned to. And the employment specialist helps the team think about employment for people who have yet been referred, haven't yet been referred to the supported employment team. You're going to get this almost exclusively from interviews and observing treatment team meetings. Um, and the idea is, like you might imagine, um, people work better when they work closely together. Like it, everything seems to be a little bit more effective. Um, so um, let's see here. They, they break it out into the components. Um, so other things for you to know, if the treatment team meets daily, um, it's recommended for high fidelity uh, that the IPS employment specialist attend one to two meetings each week um, at a minimum. Um, so if they're attending daily, that's great, but there's even a little flexibility there. Um, the agenda can affect the score. Um, so, you know, if the if the teams don't really, if they just leave IPS as an agenda item, that's not really, um, you know, rising to the level of, um, let's see which component, yeah, this component right here, um, participating actively in treatment team meetings with shared decision making. Um, you know, the idea here is actually, I think this is easier to look at on this sheet. Um, it's got the five key components. Um, you know, if IPS is an agenda item or if there's time, there's a report out from IPS, but there's really no uh, shared discussion about how employment can help somebody, whether they're open to employment or not, um, you know, we would want to be cautious about awarding that point. The documentation is interesting. Um, you know, some organizations have electronic medical records, some don't. Some have a hybrid where they have electronic medical records, but they also have paper charting. Uh, and so this can be a little convoluted to try to sort out with organizations. Um, so that's worth noting. And you would find that certainly in like chart reviews and that sort of thing. Um, employment specialist office is in close proximity to or shared with their treatment team members. This doesn't have, have to be all day. Uh, so for organizations that have multiple sites, 
you know, in a geographic area, um, it's okay for an employment specialist to have like office hours, like on Tuesday afternoons, they're at site B, but the rest of the time they're at site A. Um, the idea here is that they're proximal and available at some point um, when there's a referral. Um, and we can talk more about that if folks have questions. Um, and really the toughest one to see, I think, is that the employment specialist helps the team think about employment for people who haven't yet been referred to supported employment services. And the best way I can kind of describe this to you is just to give you an example. I was on a fidelity review and um, watching the treatment team meeting happen. And a, I think it was a therapist, was talking about a client who wasn't showing up for their appointments. And they were kind of, ventilating a little bit about how you know the person's really not going to go very far in treatment if they can't even get into sessions and the employment specialist asked you know do you know why they can't like why they haven't been showing or why they they don't attend your appointments and the therapist said well they they said they don't have money for bus fare well what do you think the employment specialist said well they said i can help right i can get some money in their pocket so they can get a bus pass by helping them find employment which is exactly sort of the plan that was hatched in that meeting and so it was a great example very organic of how um, the employment specialist helped the therapist think about how employment could help um, when they haven't even considered you know employment being something they would recommend to the client um, so worth worth noting. Um, so there are some questions here. Let me see here. Aaron says the questions that they have are amazing. They even have ones to question family members of clients. Yeah, exactly, Aaron. Um, so like they make it really, really easy. There's a whole appendix just on potential interview questions you can ask. And what happens is you'll lean on those in the beginning um, as you're kind of developing your voice as a reviewer. And over time, you'll kind of figure out which questions are kind of like the question, which is your script. You'll figure out which ones work for you um, and sort of in your interview style. Um, with these meetings, how are we factoring in COVID? Are we expecting weekly Zoom meetings? Great question. Um, I don't know that there's specific guidance that I could show you that says, yes, that's what we would do. But certainly, um, I was telling Dawn, I think it was last week, Dawn and Darren, um, that I've not actually yet been on a, a virtual fidelity review. I haven't had the opportunity yet, but at the end of it all, I mean, some of the stuff virtually in a fidelity review, you're, you're just not able to really get a good bead on. This may be one, um, especially if an organization doesn't have the capacity to allow you to uh, see virtual meetings or something like that. But, you know, I'd go so far as to say too, if you have meeting minutes, even if they're real basic meeting minutes that show the frequency of the team meeting and who is invited and how often they attended. I mean, as a fidelity reviewer, especially right now, like that would that would work for me. Um, and if the minutes aren't sufficient for me to to kind of really get a bead on, you know, the participation that IPS had, then I think I would ask questions of IPS in that interview, and I'd maybe ask questions like if I was interviewing a case manager that was in that meeting, like how often. Does IPS talk about IPS? Do they talk all the time or just an agenda item? Um, so I think that's another way to think about it too, is kind of old school um, meeting minutes can also work. Um, will email communication count during this time? Um, I, uh, it, I don't know that it would count for this item, Aaron, um, alone. Well, and I uh, will maybe, say that go ahead. Um, the WestApp folks have, have uh, so once again, that IPSworks.org website, .org, um, WestApp's put out a communique related to some of the ways that they would see agencies uh, accommodating during COVID. So um, I'm, I'm going to encourage you to some degree to go to that website and look at things like that actually on the website. Um, and then there's some ways that we've, we've kind of worked with things that are Washington specific. Um, but, uh, certainly going to that website and reading what they have available is, uh, is definitely a good thing to do at this point in time. Um, you know, if we're talking about meetings, we're talking about meetings yeah. and whether they're Zoom or whether they're something else, we're talking about a meeting. And, and so, um, at least from my standpoint, and as Paula said, we all have, you know, our own experiences and things, but but the way that I read it, they're really talking about a meeting. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Does that seem viable? Yeah, I think it makes sense. And, you know, I, I think 
the last 12 months are, um, I mean, there's no playbook, right, for any of it. And so I didn't, yeah. I'd even consider like an old school phone conference, like a conference call. Um, sure. Like that would count for me and that would make sense, especially during, it's not like, you know, it, maybe it's different pre-COVID, they were doing different things and that's okay too and good context to know. But um, I think everybody's been kind of running around using their reptile brain for the last 12 months. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, we'll just adapt and do whatever. And if an agency, you know, and it's all good faith, if they can say, well, here's what we're doing because we can't meet. And I don't know, I mean, you think of whatever bizarre thing anybody could come up with. We pull our cars into the parking lot and, you know, yell at each other out the open window. Like, sure, I'll count it, <laughs> you know, whatever. <laughs> mm -hmm. Especially in the last 12 months. I mean, great. Is it something that could be sustainable? Probably not. But, um, you know, for for the purposes of what we're trying to meet here, awesome stuff. I mean, that's great. Um, <laughs> yell at each other out the car window. Great. I love it. Um, Very clear. Well, and even, you know, some of the items have caveats for um, do you work with an agency that has a lot of rural sites? And it talks about, you know, maybe all the way along you've had to do, um, you know, Zoom meetings or something. Well, they don't say it that way, but uh, virtual meetings because your offices are too remote in order to get together with that kind of frequency. So sure. that's the other th interesting thing about the manual. You mentioned in close proximity to, and in a review one day, we looked up the definition of close proximity to, that one bulleted item in the, the um, you know, in the fidelity item. And sure. what it actually says is, if it's a multi-story building, the, the IPS team should be on the same team as the agencies referring, or the same floor, excuse me, as the agencies referring to them. So it went to that level of specificity. If you got a three, four floor building and IPS is on two, then the teams referring to them should also be on two. <laughs> yep. you know, yep. Kind of amazing. And it's, it's uh, I mean, some of this almost seems on its face value like it, it like people got together and started twisting their mustache and saying, how could we really stick it to providers and make it difficult? But the reality <laughs> is, you know, behind the scenes, I think the reality is um, what we know about a lot of other things, too, when you look at um, uh, like the integration between federally qualified healthcare clinics and mental health centers, the uh, research that's available out there, one of the things they recommend as a best practice is a, what they call a warm handoff, where if somebody's in Dawn's office seeing Dawn for, let's say, a sore throat, uh, and they uh, reveal to her that like they need, they are going through something, they need some help with their anxiety, um, the best possible scenario is Dawn could take them and walk them down the hallway and sit in my office and we could talk about that anxiety that day that minute as opposed to scheduling mm -hmm. you know so on and so forth and it's the same sort of rhyme and reason that's behind that proximity item is is that it, it's one thing to make a referral it's another thing to be able to say hey Dawn I want you to meet um, you know Darren that I've been working with and he's, he told me today he's really interested in looking for a job and I told him you that's what you do that's all you do and like you're really good at it do you think you guys could have some time to connect um, because that that sort of managing up of our colleagues and our coworkers and kind of meeting the need in the moment um, really goes a long way towards making a good connection mm -hmm. with clients. So um, if it seems absurd, uh, it's only because there's some science behind it is my experience with the IPS works people. Sure. Uh, they're not into willy nilly recommendations. They're into um, let's do the research and see what works and then that's what we'll recommend. Mm -hmm. I do see Bobby had asked a question about what about meeting more than one client in a meeting. Um, and I, I just wanted to, to kind of make clear too, um, you know, each of the FCS agencies is dealing with expectations from Amerigroup. They're dealing with expectations potentially from another referrer. Um, they're dealing with, you know, kind of IPS fidelity um, uh, expectations, if you will, or recommendations, I should say. Um, and so sometimes the lines blur between is this question really related to IPS or is it related to maybe Amerigroup and being able to bill an activity or things along that line. And today we're talking about IPS. So, um, and, and Bobby, maybe you could clarify a little more, you know, kind of what your thought process is there. But I just wanted to throw that out because um, it seemed an opportune time that um, both Darren and I, when we talk to agencies, kind of help them delineate, is this IPS related or is it something else? Because if it's something else, then, you know, we need to have an entirely different conversation. Um, if it's IPS, we can relate it back to the, the standards. 
Yep, and I'd also add to that, Dawn, that uh, most, most team meetings I have observed during a fidelity review um, are not like administrative team meetings, like, hey, everybody, don't forget, you know, United Way donations are being collected till the end of the month. The team meetings are what I would describe as sort of like clinical interdisciplinary team meetings, and um, mm -hmm. they are talking about more than one client, and they're they're kind of talking about it almost from a um, high-level programmatic, you know, go around the room, who's struggling this week, and, you know, what can we do to surround them with care and provide wraparound services to help support these clients. Um, so I, I think more often than not, the team meetings that, that I see are, they're talking about multiple, multiple clients um, in one mm -hmm. meeting. Yep, absolutely. Good point. Um, so let me let me stop right here for a quick second. It's about one, uh, it's about six till. Is this the break where uh, it's lunch for you all? Yes. Okay. Yeah, the plan I, is to I, do lunch break where we will leave this open. Um, oh, definitely. But I'm assuming we'll all just mute ourselves. Um, and so. You know, if somebody comes back early and wants to type in a question, they're welcome to do so. Um, yeah. But we wouldn't return until after the break was over. Um, so maybe it's uh, good to just kind of put out there, like, how, uh, how long of a break is appropriate? Um, and, and I'll let this, this group kind of tell me I'm good with whatever. So um, I think I, so I can't for, remember, Dawn, how long we've, we've bro we did a break for in previous training sessions. I'm glad I'm not the only one that can't remember. <laughs> yeah, it seems like a lifetime ago. Um, certainly anything between 30 minutes and an hour would be acceptable. You know, the the uh, maybe say 45 and split the difference. Yeah, I can do 45. <laughs> um, well, let's do this. If, if we break right now and come back a quarter after the hour, that would give people, you know, an extra five minutes to, to kind of either walk to the refrigerator or, or do wherever they need to go to get a bite to eat or stretch their legs. Um, so we can just kind of reconvene at quarter after the hour. Uh, like Dawn said, um, I'll leave it up and open. I'll just mute. Um, so if people do have questions, I'm, you know, I, you may see me answering during the break and, and same with Dawn and Darren, I'm sure. So um, feel free to, you know, use this time to either flip through the manual or take a complete break from Dawn and Darren and I. That's okay, too. No judgment. Um, <laughs> uh, and we will just reconvene at quarter after the hour. How does that sound? So, so we're taking so a 12 minute break. 45, what I'm hearing you say. 45, yeah. Uh, yep. Yep. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. I'm sorry, three quarters after the hour. Did I say quarter after the hour? What's wrong with me? Um, it, it's been a long week already, unfortunately. Yeah, so three quarters after the hour, we would reconvene. Holy moly. There, that sounds I, perfect. I told you guys, I'm not the math guy. I am the counselor. So <laughs> don't trust me for any measurements or math. I resemble that remark. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, everybody. And I, I will, will say, talk to you in, uh, in a little bit. Oh, go ahead, Don. Oh, I was just going to say real quickly, I have I have another obligation from one to two, so um, I just wanted to say thanks to folks for being here today. I'm I'm not going to be after the lunch break. I've got to go to a, a regularly scheduled meeting that was scheduled long before this, so I apologize for that. But um, okay. um, um, thank you all. It's good to talk with you, Don. Thanks, Don. Yep. All I'll right, talk we will see everybody tomorrow. in a little bit. Yep. Talk to you tomorrow.
All right, it looks like we have some people back already. Um, I'm and, with you, Paul. All right, all right. Um, you know, they've got that little sort of uh, icon that shows whether people are, like have this pulled up as the first window or whatever. So I'm kind of going based on that. It looks like there's still quite a few folks that are, um, I'm guessing away from the computer or whatnot. Yeah, I would say so. So we'll just give a couple more minutes. We, we, uh, especially with, you know, another day tomorrow, so. See any new question chat box, either the box. I don't see any since the lunchtime. Maybe everybody was so disappointed that I didn't know how to tell time that uh, they <laughs> couldn't think of any questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think they're overjoyed with the extra long lunch time. <laughs> sure. Sure. Makes sense. Yeah, I made a command decision that I should not, I guess. <laughs> And I'm, I forgot to log off, so I'm going to do that. Oh, all right. Uh, <laughs> we should have asked the team if 45 minutes would work for them, huh? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well. Uh, bye. All right, Logging see you, Dawn. Off. Just wait a couple more minutes. Well, maybe one more minute. I'm starting to see some folks.